evening. Welcome to the Falls Township Board of Supervisors meeting, uh, December 17th, 2013. We're going to begin with our salute to the flag, please. Thank you very much. Mrs. Pullen, can you call the roll, please? Mr. Galloway? Here. Mr. Snipes? Here. Mr. Harvey? Here. Mr. Vince? Here. Mr. Rocker? Here. Okay, thank you. Uh, before our meeting, we had an executive session. Uh, I'll ask Mr. Clark to summarize that, please. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, during the executive session, the board discussed a uh, matter of uh, personnel and also a matter of uh, collective bargaining. All right, thank you. Okay, um, first name on the agenda, on the uh, public comment, our first agenda item is public comment. First name is uh, Roland Kinney. Good evening, Roland Kenny Falls Township. It's your last meeting, Jonathan. I wish you well on whatever you do. Thank you. Long life. Uh, next, Mr. Clark, Clark you took another job on. I hope you uh, know what you're getting into. <laughs> I do, but thank you. Okay. Those meetings are on Thursday night, Mr. Kinney, in case you yeah, want to go to that. <laughs> I watch them all. I'm going to speak a little about the budget now because I don't want to get drowned out. I asked last meeting how much we had in the bank. I was told 30 million. Well, again, well, you all realized 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, we had 31 million plus. So that, 2014, we're going to go down a million. <laughs> That's the way it looks it to me. Our reserve fund has not not increase for the last four years. And the budget for 2014, it's decreasing. It's our money. We gotta be, and I don't see, I don't see the wrapping of the building down in Senior Center. That belongs to the township. And three arches, I don't see that getting done. And I say again, that 100,000 that uh, McElhaney, Senator McElhaney and State Representative Galloway brought in that 100 grand, should be able to do both of them and have money over for a tip. <laughs> uh, I wanna thank everybody that came out the Three Arches, I mean, uh, Penn Manor for Holly Nights, the two nights. We had two nice crowds them nights, even though it was nasty out one of them nights. But we had a lot of people show up. On behalf of the people at Penn Manor, I want to thank you. And plus, we're losing three more people that work there. Uh, Diane Reed, uh, you might not know her. Diane Reed, Diane Atler, and Cindy, I think her name is. Cindy, Cindy. They're leaving us in a couple weeks when I started there 10, 12 years ago. They were, they were my bosses, they're still my bosses, but <laughs> when I first went there and she asked me, what, what do you want to do? I said, anything anybody else don't want to do. And that's just what they gave me. <laughs> Somebody don't want it, they gave me the only, only job I didn't like is lighting them candles on Holly night, you light one and by the time you get down to the end you turn around they all start going out <laughs> run up and light them again it's for young people <laughs> but i just want to say happy anniversary uh, <laughs> merry christmas and happy new years right. happy happy whatever honda whatever you call <laughs> enjoy your holidays <laughs> thank you <laughs> this man he's going to give us jobs we want jobs He's not. He, I, don't think, yeah, I don't think he's giving us jobs, but <laughs> he doesn't mind the work. 
Uh, Mr. Mariani. Well, we're getting to the season, so a blessed Christmas to everybody and our families, and uh, peace on earth to men of goodwill. Now, I understand, and I've always supported the use of host fees for extraordinary capital expenditures, uh, major repairs, and replacements. However, I've always said normal operating expenses should be supported solely by taxes and not host fees. Host fees, however, over the period of time, have become a major source of funding for our budgets. And as a result of that, and my attitude toward that, I've consistently urged this board to expand our tax base. This is something that's going to have to be done, whether you do it or not, but I do believe it's your responsibility to start that process. Now, there are a variety of revenue sources available to second class townships. I heard what you said about the dock thing and the, uh, uh, the hotel. Uh, hotel, hotel, so on and so forth, but uh, I've listed some that I believe are available to second class townships. So if you would please take one and pass it down. Sure. There's one, Mr. Clark, that you can share with our other council, and I would never forget you. Okay? So I, I, I've listed uh, these uh, sources, and I believe they're correct. If I'm not, our council can, uh, could correct me. And I believe that based on the demographics of our township, these eight sources would result in millions of dollars in income, and uh, what I would like to see them do is to uh, remove our reliance on host fees. So when I listed them, uh, what the revenue sources are, and I believe they're available to second-class townships, if I'm not, Mr. Clark and his uh, associate could correct me, and the percentages of second-class townships uh, that levy these uh, sources. For instance, real property, and this is based on Pennsylvania, 98% use it, occupational flat rate, and millage, 10%, per capita, 70%, earned income, 96%. If you go to the northeast of Pennsylvania, you'll find it's 100%. Realty transfer, 93%, amusement, 5%, mercantile, 1%. Occupational privilege, 49. I think that using some of this to expand our tax base would increase or enable us to increase our reserves and move forward to the other plan that I would like to do, which is perpetual income program for Falls residents. So tonight, while you're approving our budget, uh, Please take a look at this, think about it, and I'd like to see you act on it. And again, a blessed Christmas to everybody, and uh, peace on earth to men of goodwill. Mm -hmm. And Jonathan, yeah. I wish you yeah, the we'll very best yeah. of everything, yeah. and I wish that God would bless you and your family. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, okay thank you. Okay. All right. We certainly, I mean, there are quite a few taxes we have in the township. Um, you know, the occupational privilege essentially is, is that the moment? No, we have the local services. Local services. Okay. All right. So, okay. Thank you very much. Um, other name on the list is uh, Jim Prokopiak. Name from the past. Good evening, gentlemen. Jim Prokopiak, Falls Township. Just wanted to come out. Uh, almost forgot about the meeting. But I want to come out and uh, say thank you to Jonathan for uh, really 12 years of distinguished service. I think you've uh, 
really done a great job. You know, I was there 12 years ago when you, you were, were sworn in, and it was a completely different Falls Township. It was a place that was uh, very contentious and very volatile. And uh, we can talk about all the accomplishments, accomplishments that you've been able to do in the 12 years. But I think the singular greatest thing you've been able to do is really change the direction of Falls Township with some calm leadership, some introspection, some willing to bridge gaps to people, and really work hard. You, I never remember you raising your voice or, uh, <laughs> or getting involved in a, in a dispute. You're always trying to be the calming factor on the board. And I think that was an important thing as you stepped into a board that was uh, very different. So uh, I want to thank you, and uh, I wish you well. I'm sure I, I know I'll see you, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's important what you brought to the table, and uh, I appreciate your service, and I want to thank you. That's it. Have thank a good night. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Uh, those are the names on the resident sign-in sheets. Are there any other resident who wishes to speak? No? Okay. Uh, the non-resident sign-in sheet, we have a couple names. Uh, Judith Franlin. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Judith Franlin. I'm from New Hope, but I am here representing the League of Women Voters of Bucks County. And I have provided your secretary with a copy of some of a letter which uh, I wrote uh, yesterday and sent to the uh, Department of Public Work, Department of the Bureau of Environmental Cleanup in Brownfields. That's <laughs> a long, a long name. Uh, and it is in, with regard to the application for uh, new, Seaville, new Seaview LLC. Uh, our league uh, s found out on Friday that that application uh, was, uh, had been posted and that public comments were due by Monday. That would be yesterday. So I've given you a copy of my public comment letter and I just wanted to I express some concerns that our league had. Uh, obviously, we have not had time to get a lot of information. I believe you're going to be discussing it tonight, so we'll, we'll, we'll learn more. Um, we noted that um, since this permit is being considered by the Bureau of Environmental Cleanup in Brownfields, uh, we thought that suggested that there may be some hazardous substances involved. Now, the permit is for uh, installation of 11 storage tanks that, contain o that can contain over 2 million gallons of, of substances. So uh, since we did not know exactly what was in that, that caused us some concern, both the volume and the lack of understanding of what these substances were and where they would come from. Uh, the, uh, the fact that this is a pretty, po a pretty populous area with heavily, tra heavily trafficked Route 1, uh, and the Delaware River nearby caused us some concern as to whether there would be danger from a uh, possible accident in transporting these materials or whether there might be some uh, breach of the tanks. And so we felt, well, we need to know more and uh, we hope we will find, mo find out more. Our biggest concern as a league actually was mainly with the transparency of the process in that we only found out about this one day before comments were due. Uh, and there was a third, it w this was a 30 day comment period as, as I understood it. Uh, what we have done is we've asked our, the legislators and uh, we would urge the DEP to extend the comment period so that the public can be informed, uh, can know about what's going on and make their voices heard. So that's the gist of what we asked and uh, that is what I wanted to uh, uh, indicate uh, to this board uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity to have uh, been able to come here and say that and I hope you will take a look at our letter and consider these uh, sources because I think that the people of the township need to know what's going on, where it is and, and what it might entail. And I thank you very much and wish you all good holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Winfield, is it T Tatum? Is that right? Close enough. <laughs> I apologize. I hope that's already been mangled many times. <laughs> uh, it's Winfield Tatham, and uh, I live in Holland. I'm a retired uh, financial executive, and I have a list of questions, 
that perhaps may be answered er, uh, later in the evening or not, but that I would like to go on record uh, related to lubricycle. Okay. And of course, they are concerns about what risks are there. Mm -hmm. It may be a perfectly good project, it may not be, I do not know, mm -hmm. but uh, like the lady there, we'd like to get more information and like to have the questions answered and go from there. Okay, just uh, just to interrupt just for a second, Mr. Tatham. Um, you know, I, I, the letter of transparency, just to let you know how we do things, uh, and largely because of the gentleman sitting my right who brought a lot of transparency here when he came to this board 12 years ago. Uh, we public comment now. Uh, when we hear the agenda item, which is next, uh, we will also have public comment then. Uh, so you feel free to ask questions now. Uh, you might get some answers during the presentation. If there aren't any, you can, you can then get up again during that public comment period to ask other questions, but go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, these will just go on the record, and uh, if these gentlemen are here from LubraCycle, why they can address what they think is appropriate. Question number one, describe the recycling process. Is it a refinery or is it some other process? And how many recycling plants are there in the greater Philadelphia area? Does the 2.1 million gallon storage capacity represent the maximum or is expansion possible on the site? If so, how much? Where does the oil come from for recycling? The county, the state, other states? How is it delivered? Truck, rail, pipeline, etc. Is there an impact on traffic? New Seaview LLC is a new company. What experience do they have in the field? Since they are a limited liability corporation, what assets and resources do they have in case of spill, fire, etc.? Who would be liable for cleanup <coughs> if there was a problem? Falls Township, the county, the state, the feds, the taxpayers? Does Falls have a hazmat team? Is an environmental analysis, impact analysis required? If so, has it been done? What approvals are required from DEP at the state level for New Seaview and for Falls Township? Does Falls have an emergency plan to deal with emergencies? What are the downside risks if New Seaview fails? Who cleans up? Who pays? What are the benefits for Falls in the area? Taxes, jobs, etc. And has Falls Township done a risk benefit analysis? As a former financial controller, these are the kinds of questions that we would have asked of any project that we were undertaking. And so I think that uh, where there is such a volume of what might be hazardous materials, uh, it is worth looking very carefully to be sure what the consequences might be uh, in case of a problem. You know, we've seen many situations, uh, for example, the deep water uh, well oil well in the uh, Gulf where they were not prepared for problems and the consequences were catastrophic. Two million gallons is a lot. So I think that uh, many people, as they become aware of this project, would like to understand what it is and how, uh, what kind of due diligence has been done in terms of looking at potential problems as well as the benefits. And I'm sure we would all like to see uh, business flourish, new jobs, tax revenue, and so forth. But uh, I think that we would be asking for uh, public hearings to air and answer these types of questions. Okay. Thank you. All right, I'll thank you. Leave copies of these. Okay, yeah, I managed to jot down a lot of them, but I'm, I'm, I think I missed a couple. <laughs> so, um, I appreciate that. Um, those are all the names on the non-resident sign-in sheet. Any others, non-residents? Okay. 
Uh, just uh, to address a couple of the questions that were raised, in terms of um, the process tonight, uh, preliminary land development for Lubricycle um, for this project that's been referenced a couple times here this evening uh, means that they are giving us uh, their plans on how to move forward, what they plan to do, what they make a presentation in a second here on moving forward. Uh, this plan has already been before our planning commission. It has been looked at by our engineers. It has been looked at by the fire marshal, who also runs the environmental services in this uh, township, and the um, environmental advisory council here in the township has looked at it as well. Uh, if it is approved tonight for preliminary land development, um, it would be with some uh, suggestions and 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 things that uh, you know the the applicant uh, will comply with, or maybe you know work with our engineer to change, uh, and then he'll have to come back to the planning commission. Uh, at a later date for final land development and back to this board for land, final land development. So it isn't, um, this is not a one-shot deal. This isn't uh, approved tonight and is done. Um, <laughs> there is uh, there is still some time. In terms of the DEP and the amount of time they give, uh, that's obviously nothing we have any control over. Uh, and uh, we, you know that's not necessarily something that we have any responsibility for or, or knowledge of how to influence them on. I did have some conversation over the weekend with uh, Commissioner Marseglia, who had gotten a copy of this letter, I believe, that, uh, or at some point, uh, had gotten some input, um, and so she was asking me about the project, uh, a little bit about it. Uh, I can address a couple of these things, and I will obviously let Lubercycle do their presentation, and they'll be able to address some others. Uh, and if they don't hit some of these, I'll try and keep track, and if there's something they don't hit, obviously you might keep track yourself and uh, we'll help fill in any gaps. Uh, in terms of Falls Township, um, our fire department, especially the Falls Township Fire Department, we have three in the township. The Falls Township Fire Department covers this area and special and has specialized training and equipment in terms of dealing with chemical and industrial fires since that's an area they control is an area of the township that has is heavily industrialized. It's, it's essentially the former steel mill. Um, in terms of um, Cleanup. I mean, the property, and I'll, I'm not sure if it's being leased or bought, uh, is owned by U.S. Steel. It's U.S. Steel's private property, uh, and so I'm not sure where the liability lies for cleanup, but that would be part of that in, as well. And um, <clears throat> I do know in terms of risk-benefit analysis, obviously there's – this is a land development, so if the applicant meets all of our code, um, you know, there's really no grounds for the township, if they're meeting the law, there's really no grounds for the township to turn them down. Uh, it's not necessarily a risk-benefit analysis. This is a private business. It's no different than someone who wants to paint their house orange with purple shutters. Uh, might not like it, but it's their house. And unless they're in a historic district where we can sort of control that kind of thing, there's, there's really nothing the township can do. Um, it is their property. They have rights as property owners as long as they meet the ordinances and codes of the township and obviously the state. Then, then there's you know, and our, our job is to make sure they do that with these with these hearings that we're having now and, and in the future. Um, and I think that was just a couple of the ones I wanted to just touch on. Oh, uh, benefits. Obviously, you know, we'll, we'll hear about employment opportunities for people. I'm not sure how many jobs will be created by this uh, construction jobs, and then obviously full-time jobs. This property is inside the KLIZ, which is the Keystone Opportunity Improvement Zone, which is a tax-free zone. Uh, created in 2000, uh, well, officially started in 2005 for 14 years, and so it has a few years left uh, where they are free from state, county, township, and school taxes. Um, um, they will have to file permit fees, so when they're constructing things or deconstructing things, they'll be filing permit fees so the township will receive some money through that. But um, but otherwise, and presumably, hopefully, Lubercycle is a raging success and they're still here uh, when, uh, when the KYZ ends, and which, at which time they will come online as a tax rateable property in Falls Township. So, um, I don't know if there's any other kind of comments just to address a couple things before we turn it over to the second agenda item. We covered it. Okay. All right. So, uh, hopefully, that addresses some of the issues and, and definitely some of the questions you asked are questions that we have. We don't know all the answers to either, so we're going to be educated uh, as, as you will be um, in terms of what's next. But we'll move on now with item two, which is Lubercycle. Um, Mr. Gray? Yes, this is a preliminary plan of land development for Lubercycle. The applicant is New Seaview LLC. <laughs> They are proposing a construction of tanks and ancillary structures totaling 
540 square feet on a site of 32 acres occupied by two existing industrial buildings. Location is 150 Solar Drive. Uh, representing the applicant tonight is Mr. Tom Hecker. Members of the board, good evening. Tom Hecker on behalf of the applicant. Uh, we're here tonight, as you are obviously aware, to uh, have the board consider the preliminary plan uh, that has been submitted uh, by uh, New Seaview LLC. Um, this is a uh, recycling application in its purest form because it involves not only um, the recycling of a of good property, but it also involves uh, recycling uh, of uh, oil. And um, you're going to hear tonight from uh, Bill Packer, uh, who is the principal of the applicant uh, who wants to bring uh, this operation uh, to 150 Solar Drive. This property was, in fact, uh, for a while, a brief time, I suppose, um, the um, headquarters for AE Polysilicon. Uh, that um, company closed. Uh, the facility there remains, so it's an opportunity effectively to uh, put a vacant building back into operation and, in fact, expand the operation, as uh, Mr. Packer will explain to you uh, what's in store. Um, we did not get a copy of the questions. If you have an extra copy, I'm going to have Mr. Packer in his presentation uh, attempt to answer as many of those questions as possible going forward. Thank you. I appreciate that. So with that very brief background, I'd like to call Mr. Packer up. Bill will explain to you a little bit about his background and uh, what it is that he's proposing to do and how he's proposing to do it at this location. Thank you. <clears throat> I appreciate the opportunity to uh, present our project. Thank you very much. I know you volunteer your time, and I appreciate you doing that at this time of year. <clears throat> um, I'm very excited about this project. I've looked at any number of sites uh, from New Jersey to Maryland to New York and uh, have always wanted to do something here in Pennsylvania. I'm a resident of Montgomery County. I have built, owned, and operated two plants, refineries in Paulsboro, New Jersey. Uh, they operated at approximately 85,000 barrels per day, which is over 30 times the size of the plant we're currently proposing. Uh, those plants ran uh, crude oil, which as a feedstock are much more volatile and have light ends and, and more metals and more contaminants. What we're planning to do here is to take used motor oil that's currently in every one of your automobiles that you all have, trucks, buses, etc., collect that material, and rather than burn it as it is today at many public utilities and in boilers and apartment houses and other places that use industrial fuel oil, we plan to take that oil, recycle it, and put it back into commerce as a base oil for lubricants to remanufacture lubricating oils. So rather than burning this oil, we plan to collect it and recycle it through our plant, clean it back up, treat it, and send it back into commerce. Um, unlike many petroleum products, used motor oil or motor oil as a generic category is not categorized as a hazardous waste. There are many reasons for this one of which is it's not volatile, so there are not a lot of vapors that come out of it, nor does motor oil go into the groundwater because of its viscosity. It's too thick to penetrate in the ground. Uh, some of the characteristics of our plant, I'll go through and describe the process we're going to use. Um, I think some of you are familiar with the site, but the site's approximately 32 acres. Uh, this is far larger than we had originally anticipated. But some of the assets that existed at AE Polysilicon were very attractive to us. And those were mainly the rainwater, the existing rainwater basins, the existing containment pond. Uh, we like the pad where the existing process equipment is on because it's curved. 
it's concrete and has the ability to collect anything that comes out of the process area, including rainwater, collect it so it can be treated uh, prior to it either being hauled off or discharged. Um, that's a very valuable asset for us. Um, in addition, existing at the location are an office building where we can have some of our sales staff, as well as uh, existing uh, maintenance building where we plan to <coughs> mix uh, the lubricants into finished products. Um, also sitting there are existing utility equipment, uh, particularly the cooling water tower and the boiler water building. These are assets that we would normally have to duplicate if we were to build our own individual site. And since they're already existing, it's quite advantageous to us. Um, you see in the plan here that currently the rail spurs existing uh, on the property run this way. We plan on taking those rail lines down over the existing employee parking lot that AEP used where they had permission for 135 parking spots. <clears throat> we plan to take advantage of that because it's an impermeable surface. We'd like to put the rail lines on there so that when we bring product in, we can assure ourselves that should we have any spillage, we can collect it and put it back into recycling. Uh, for us, <clears throat> the loss of any feedstock is expensive for us. And uh, you know, as a result, we, the care and custody we take of that material is, is value added as well as uh, environmentally added. So that's important to us, and we plan to put that right in here over the existing parking, and, and we have to re, uh, move in and put new parking in here for the employees. Um, the plan uh, calls for running the plant at approximately 40 million gallons per year. That sounds large in gallons, but in terms of refining, that's about 3,000 barrels a day, which is a relatively it's a modest plant. No refineries are built at that size. They're only built at that size when you're handling specialty products, which this is. It manufactures lubricants, which ultimately, ultimately end up being a high value product. Um, essentially, what's happening in our development is that this existing infrastructure sits here, and we're merely removing the process units that exist there now and putting our process units in the exact same place. Again, I explained the infrastructure is important because we can collect rainwater and effluents from that process unit, either <coughs> treat it and discharge it or collect it and have it treated offsite. Um, the bulk of our development, um, I'm not sure whether you're familiar in the AEP plan, but they had two uh, phases. This was phase one, which they developed. This was reserved for their phase two development, which they had approached you for approval on, but never executed. Uh, our plan is to use this area for our storage uh, facility. And what that does is we will bring our feedstocks in in this portion of the plant. We will mix them to a suitable uh, viscosity level for charging to our unit. They run through our unit and then the products come out uh, into these various storage tanks over here. Um, you know, I certainly under, understand the concerns that were expressed by some of the citizens. I would have the very same questions were I not as familiar with the business as I am. Um, the storage tanks, as an example, sit on concrete pads that, uh, with diked walls around them that are capable of containing catastrophic failures of the tanks. In addition to that, these are lined with, uh, with liners that are impermeable, so none of that material can seep into the soil. Not most of the material is incapable of doing that. Yes, there are some of the lighter ends that are capable of doing that. Therefore, you have the impermeable liner, so that material can be recaptured. In addition, rainwater that falls into these impermeable basins is taken out tested, treated, and discharged. It can't be discharged if it doesn't meet the criteria that exist in our permit. Um, another thing that we found attractive um, 
was that the utilities provided to this site, there was an existing utility agreement that AEP had with U.S. Steel so that we could assume some of those, uh, some of those obligations by U.S. Steel to supply gas, water, as well as the, the obligation to take discharge waters and treat them in their effluent plant that exists on site. That we found that very attractive. Um, in terms of the technology that we're using uh, to treat these used motor oils, it's not really a big secret. I mean, if you think of collecting used motor oil, motor oil comes out of a refinery as one small stream out of a very sophisticated plant. In fact, <clears throat> if you look at it nationally, less than 4% of, of crude oil that's charged into all the refineries in the U.S. comes out as a lubricant. So it's a nice, thin stream that exists with, uh, you know, <clears throat> the same boiling point. It's a very good stream for using and cat cracking and or cleaning up the uh, dirt and things that are put in in your crankcase, clean that up and put it back into commerce. So that's an exciting aspect of our project. Uh, the technology we're using is really uh, uh, very well known. It's been used for, you know, 30 years. Uh, a plant very similar to ours started operation in 1985 out in San Francisco. There's a large plant in Chicago that operates at uh, three times the capacity that we're planning. Uh, using the same technology, but it's a technology that exists in other refineries. It's just applied in a different way <clears throat> because lube oil, if you heat it in a refinery in a traditional sense, it has a lot of polymerized rubber that goes into these oils you buy that, that carry the additive package and keep suspended in the oil all the dirt. Since you've seen your interval for changing your oil go from 2,000 to 3,000 to 5,000 to 10,000. The reason you can do that is because there's more additives in there to keep that dirt in suspension and still allow the lubricant to work. So the trick in our refining process is to make sure we don't heat it up quickly, turn that stuff into a coke or, you know, goo essentially. And, and it clogs the pipe. So that's the art of applying the technology in our process. It's very straightforward. We, we uh, put the uh, oil through and heat it up only to about 600 degrees. Normally in refineries you run at 750. Um, we do that so as to prevent the pipes from clogging up and we can extract those, uh, those additives in that fashion under a vacuum pressure. So um, out comes the product. The product can be used uh, in several ways. We plan on taking out two different cuts. Uh, there's a, a light oil in the top. There's a middle distillate, middle viscosity oil. And then the bottoms come out as what's called asphalt extender, which go and are, will be sold to another local refinery for mixing in with the asphalt feedstock. Um, I know there's a list of questions which I'd be happy to take a chance at answering, but that's the gist of our, our project. And I'm, I can only say in the operations of my other plants, uh, we don't really have anything to hide. There's nothing that's uh, exotic here. There's nothing we're not happy to explain. Um, you know, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, my operations in the past had an extraordinary safety record. Um, you know, it's my hope that I get a chance to utilize this site. Uh, you know, I, I plan to be here for quite some time. I think, uh, you know, my planned operation is to have initially approximately 50 jobs, uh, 36 in the operations and the balance in management, supervision, and uh, care and custody of facility. Um, I, I have enough room here to expand that uh, into several other aspects of the business, one of which is to take the base oils at this site and turn them into finished products, but that is not included in that calculation. So most of your products... Uh, uh, Mr. Hacker, use the microphone, please. The microphone, Mr. <laughs> most of the product uh, you mentioned, does that arrive by rail or is also arrived by truck? Um, well, so I heard alluded concern about the traffic studies. 
uh, and, and that gets to your question about how the product comes in. Uh, I, I would like the flexibility to have the product be able to come in by both barge, by rail, and by truck. But if it were to only come in by truck, you would, we would have no more than 25 trucks a day coming in and 25 trucks a day going out if all the products moved by truck. Um, as you may remember, and I think I recall, that the site AEP was uh, certified in the traffic study for 135 employees. So even if I moved everything in and out, I have you know, less than half of the traffic that they had provided for. But I sincerely hope, it's my far and away my biggest preference, that I can get large batches of the feedstock to come in by river for several reasons. First of all, the accumulation of the material has been done elsewhere. The testing of the material has been done elsewhere. And all I have to do is verify what they said they were giving me I got at the dock. And then I know I have a lot of feedstock for, you know, a half a month or sitting right there in my tank and I'm, I sleep easy with that. But your intention is to reinstall the rail line, which I think had been removed by the former owner of the property, to be able to move some of the product in by rail. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. I, you know, I'd like to have the flexibility to uh, not only bring in feedstock by rail, but also take out my products by rail. Um, you, the collection operation. Uh, sometimes, you know, oil, uh, the used motor oil streams are available in Canada. You can bring them down by rail. Sometimes you have availability in the southeast. Sometimes it's over near the Mississippi. Those can only travel here really by rail uh, economically. Currently, uh, this property is owned by the former AE Polysilicon Company, correct? Is New Seaview purchasing that property? and? The reason I ask that question is that in the event all these safety measures that are being installed and will be required by DEP fail and there's a spill, who's responsible for the cleanup? So yes, New Seaview is purchasing the property from AE Polysilicon and will be the fee owner of that ground. Uh, under the terms and conditions of the permits we have applied for at the DEP, principally the residual solid waste permit. Uh, new Seaview was required prior to the commencement of operations to post a substantial bond of the order of magnitude of a million dollars to provide for uh, any cleanup that would occur. Obviously, catastrophic cleanups are covered by insurance policies, which we're also required to have from both the department and, and by the financing vehicle to the refinery. One of the important considerations, I believe, is uh, what does this um, reusing this former AP facility, turning it into LubriCycle, mean in terms of job creation? Right. I mentioned uh, the uh, refinery operations take approximately 50 people, 36 of which are involved in the uh, actual operation and maintenance of the process units. Uh, the balance are uh, management as well as personnel to take care of the uh, and maintain the facilities. Uh, the total is about 50. Now, uh, as I mentioned, that's that's only uh, one phase of the operation. Should we expand to the uh, compounding and blending, that could be as many as 20 more, 20 to 25 more. I think he has covered uh, the questions that were raised by the uh, resident, and uh, I'd like to ask whether the board has any specific qu uh, questions regarding this facility, the process, or anything else. Um, I don't know if we want to. Don't know if we want to do questions now or wait till we go to kind of go through the um, review letter uh, and then sort of do all the questions at once. What's what's the pleasure of the board? Do some questions now and then other questions later. Yeah, there's a few that he touched on. It doesn't matter to me. Whatever it is, one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. whatever, you, whatever you want to do. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Let's do it at the end. At the end? Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll let you go through the uh, review letter then, and maybe we'll come back to some questions. And then we'll have some public comment as well if anybody has any follow-up questions. I have uh, before me, gentlemen, the uh, 
proposed resolution which I received uh, from the Township Professionals, which incorporates the terms of the uh, review letter of the Township Engineer dated December 12, 2013. Um, I'll refer to the resolution because I think everything is sort of summarized, if that's okay. Um, the resolution, as the review letter, broken into a couple of different components. Uh, the first dealing with the uh, zoning ordinance, uh, section uh, A1, um, simply notes the requirement that uh, the ordinance states that vibrations, fumes, vapors, gases, storage, and disposal of waste should meet the standards set by uh, PADEP, OSHA, and any other federal, state, or county agency. Um, the applicant will provide documentation that indicates compliance with these standards. Obviously, that's a will comply. And that process, by the way, as mentioned by Bill, is underway with the DEP. We are currently in the comment period. Item number two references section 2942B1 um, about uh, the requirement for a cluster planting is dense plant material, not less than four feet in height, uh, to be maintained and provided between the off-street parking areas and any lot line or street line. Um, I was advised by our engineer, who, by the way, couldn't be here tonight because of the ice in the upper part of the county where he is uh, currently uh, located, uh, but I'm told that um, this was an item when this property was created, when it was subdivided that um, the applicant paid a fee in lieu of uh, non-compliance with this item, and I believe the township found it appropriate. So I'm suggesting that that issue has been addressed when this property was previously subdivided. Item number three uh, talks about the performance standard requirements and the documentation that's required uh, for uh, demonstration that the operation to be in compliance with these standards, that's a will comply item. <coughs> Section B relates to the Subdivision and Land Development Ordinance 190-137B, um, the requirement dealing with the uh, design details and practices uh, specified in the Falls Township Ordinance for curbing, uh, uh, meeting those specifications. We've asked for a waiver from that uh, requirement as this will be curbing that's installed on uh, private property. Section 191-37G4, uh, references a uh, waiver request uh, relating to the tree requirement for parking areas uh, for every six parking spaces in a single row, one tree of one half inch caliper minimum every 12 parking spaces and double loaded rows of parking. Um, although this waiver was previously granted with a prior uh, application, as noted by Mr. Packer, we are effectively uh, changing the parking. Uh, we are eliminating, there was a substantial number of spaces, we are relocating and reinstalling the rail line and adding, reinstalling 53 parking spaces, I believe is the number. So uh, that uh, is an item that uh, we would offer a fee in lieu of compliance since we are in fact disturbing that area. I believe it's 10 trees and uh, I think it's $250 a tree, so we'd be happy to pay a fee in lieu of providing uh, those trees. Section 191.44C3 um, deals with the requirement about the uh, slope, 1.5 horizontal to vertical. Um, that's a will comply item. Our engineer will resolve that with the township engineer. Uh, section 191.48 um, is the street tree issue about the street, and I believe it's the same requirement that was in the zoning ordinance. Uh, and again, uh, that was an item that was addressed when the property was subdivided. I don't know that anything further needs to occur there. 191.52, uh, erosion and sedimentation control requirements subject to the conservation district and DEP approval. That's a will comply item. Uh, item number six deals with section 191.62B, uh, requesting uh, a waiver from the uh, requirement for curb to be provided along the streets at front on a land development. Um, again, that was one that was previously granted for the AEP poly property and we're asking for that waiver. 191.78 B6 is also a waiver dealing with the uh, scale of the map um, and the locations in, re in relation to adjoining property within 1,000 feet, so we've asked for a waiver. Um, and eight deals with 191.78 C2, it's a partial waiver 
with their names, location, street widths, et cetera, within 200 feet of any uh, property. Um, Mr. Trollman, did you receive a, an aerial on that? I'm sure we did, yeah. Yeah, I thought you did, too. So we we reason for it's a partial waiver because we'll provide the uh, aerial. <coughs> Section C deals with the separate stormwater management ordinance, uh, 187.12e. Uh, the top width of 10 feet for the detention basin area, although this isn't a detention basin, it's a containment area, but it's a will comply item. Our engineer will resolve that with the township engineer. <laughs> Section 187.13b1 uh, was waiver from the pipe size of 15 inches. Um, so that's a waiver request. Waiver 187.16 uh, regarding uh, infiltration BMPs as part of the overall stormwater management plan. Uh, 187.17 is a will comply item, item number four. Section D, uh, our traffic comments. Uh, the traffic engineer has requested uh, truck turning templates and uh, details for traffic sign types. So we've actually provided that, uh, although that hasn't yet been confirmed by the traffic engineer. We can list those as will comply items, but they've already been done. Um, under section E, general stormwater management requirements. Item one, uh, requesting detail of the proposed containment inlets with gate valves will comply. Item number two, uh, requesting detail and notes for the operation of the proposed railroad containment area uh, and to provide uh, maintenance notes and schedule on the post-construction sewer management plan. That's a will comply item. Section F deals with general comments. Uh, stating that all waiver requests have to be provided on the record plan, and that's a will comply item. Uh, item two, uh, plans to provide the cross section of the new railroad tracks, uh, that's a will comply item. Uh, item three, request details for the containment walls, the storage tanks, and storage tank racks that include cross sections, elevations, heights, foundations, tanks, filling devices, etc. Um, that's what we'll comply with. Uh, I, I talked to Mr. Sullivan about this. We're going to add a note to the plan to indicate that those details will be provided with the building permit application that will all be shown on the construction drawings. And I believe that that's satisfactory, but our plan will note that it will be provided with the building plan. Um, item four states that all comments on the traffic engine must be addressed as noted in section D above. We're doing that. That's what we'll comply. Uh, Item five, the township fire marshal comments. Uh, those fire marshal comments are items that will be normally handled with the building permit. That's a willing, as a will comply. Uh, item six, all comments from the Falls Township Engineer to be addressed, Falls Township Authority Engineer to be addressed. Uh, that's a will comply. And then uh, section E really uh, repeats the waivers uh, which I've highlighted previously uh, in section E1 and E2. And that's really it. With, uh, the board addresses the waiver issues. There's probably only about half a dozen or so comments uh, that need some additional work between the uh, design engineer and the township engineer. We've only asked for preliminary plan approval this evening. Uh, we'll be back with final plans, as Mr. Harvey noted earlier, so we have the opportunity uh, to address those remaining items which are outstanding. Uh, the use is a use which is permitted in this MPM district. Right. And of course, the property uh, is within uh, the U.S. Steel uh, complex, so it's certainly consistent with the uses uh, in the surrounding area. So we think it's a, a good application. Uh, we all talk and hear about recycling, and this is uh, an opportunity uh, to have a uh, top notch recycling facility in the township, and again, to effectively. Uh, make use of a property which has been uh, effectively closed, or a building and operation uh, which has been closed and shut down. So that's pretty much it. Any questions? We're happy to try to answer them. Uh, just before I turn over to board members for comment and questions, uh, and then we'll go to public, uh, I wanted to see if you were, we have a copy here, Bucks County Department of Health. A letter dated October 16th, 2013. With some I did questions. not receive that, Mr. Harvey. Okay. So. Uh, the, this, I think, was sent to the DEP. Uh, has six questions on there, two of which you've sort of answered just in your presentation, the two presentations. Mm -hmm. I just want to, I'll give you a copy of this. The first four I'm kind of curious about, not that you have to answer them right this second, but perhaps the uh, the applicants can take a look while, while you're at the microphone and we'll have board members um, 
raise their questions and uh, he can kind of take a look over those. So. Uh, we'll turn over uh, to board members. Uh, Mr. Galloway, comments or questions? Uh, yes, I was uh, actually uh, studying the questions uh, drawn up by the Department of Health, especially questions number one and number six. Number six, uh, it talks about uh, containment dikes uh, built around your storage uh, tanks. How large are the storage tanks and, and is how many? Uh, the tanks vary in size. Uh, they're uh, typically what we do is when the feedstock comes in, we put them in relatively small tanks, about approximately 15,000 gallons, while we uh, test and verify that what was represented was in those trucks, tank cars, uh, is in fact true. We hold that. Uh, so those are, that's initially how we handle the product. When we, when we feed the unit, we have two tanks that are approximately 1.2 million gallons each, uh, where we, once we've certified that the product is indeed clean, we put that into the feed tank and then we alternate back and forth. We don't, when we have a tank that's actively feeding the unit, we don't like to put in any new product into that tank. Okay. Bill was actually pointing with the letter to the plan back there, and I know the board couldn't see it, so I think I'll have them do it in front of it. Okay, so these tanks are um, a series of tanks from 10 to 20,000 gallons where we take incoming product. Uh, once we've determined that, that that meets our quality, uh, we then put it into one of these two tanks right here that are 1.2 million gallons each. Uh, the reason we have two is we don't like to put into a tank that's actively feeding the unit, we don't like to put new material. And then because once again, prior to switching from the active feed tank to the waiting feed tank, we test to make sure that it's exactly what we want at the right viscosity. Uh, so those are far, far and away the largest tanks. And then we have uh, tanks for process water and we also have tanks where we can take off spec feed for whatever the reason. Maybe it has too much water, maybe the viscosity isn't right, uh, maybe it's the wrong mix to make the products we're trying to make, uh, in which case we test it again and we can decide whether we can use it or we have to uh, have it taken away from the site. Um, these are our storage tanks over here for our finished products. Uh, they vary in size from uh, typically, you know, these are about 45,000 gallons each for the blending tanks. And uh, they, they go from uh, 875,000 gallons, uh, these two are 26,000 gallons. And the product tanks over here are 500,000 gallons, 625, and 260. So, the tanks vary in size, and the reason is uh, that uh, certain of the products come out in different percentages, so that's why we have tanks that are different sizes to accommodate those products. I think Mr. Galloway also asked about item number six on that letter. Do you that that was item number six. On item number one, you seem to have addressed that. Um, so if <coughs> it doesn't meet your criteria for what you need, it. it it's not because it's a hazardous waste, it's still motor oil, but it, it's, uh, it's just not up to spec for what you want to do? That's correct. The viscosity can be off. Uh, you know, sometimes you can adjust for that by mixing other product in, but you don't want to put it in the active feed tank. So you hold it there. Uh, typically, uh, this area here is where you would identify anything that was off spec. And, and we all know that chlorides and solvents are the issues that, that we look for as a contaminant. That those are things like halogenated compounds like PCBs, which we're very sensitive to. You test every single load that comes in for that. Uh, you know, they're very stringent regulations. 
Uh, you know, we can't run anything that's in excess of a thousand parts per million. Um, uh, the process does have the ability to take some of those solvents out and actually recycle them should we choose to do so. But um, there's a water discharge limit here on the property that's very sensitive to any chlorinated solvents. So we're very sensitive to that and therefore testing these materials as they come in. That's one of the reasons why we prefer to receive in larger shipments, uh, particularly by barge uh, and or from another collector who's already certified that the material's clean and we're, what we're doing is verifying, <coughs> not screening. So we prefer that that operation occur off-site rather than on-site, but we have to provide for the ability to do both. So, so if it doesn't meet your specs, the, uh, the container that it's in will act as a um, uh, what do they uh, ask in the question is it will quarantine it'll it'll uh, keep it away from the rest of your product well, well my hope is that the operation uh, tests it as an example were it to come in by truck the truck would come into the property and it would wait here a sample from that truck would be tested immediately for chlorinated solvents and were that load to exceed our limits we tell them to take it wherever you got it Take it, take it away. We don't want it. So we, we would expect to have a very sensitive screening process for those. That, that screening process is going to be in place? Yes. Oh, it's required under our permit. Uh, Can I jump in on that? Because that yeah. was one of my questions as well. Sure. Mm -hmm. So there's this, when they use the word quarantine, anything that comes in that doesn't meet your standards doesn't mean it's going to be hazardous or potentially a danger. Oh, that's absolutely correct. Okay. You're correct. I mean, there's any number of reasons that you wouldn't accept the load. It may, you know, have a bunch of solids in it. You can imagine when you're collecting used motor oil, these a lot of people have it. There, there's some people that do it very well, so you get a nice, clean product. There's other people that, that put it in drums. Those things have nuts, bolts, a lot of solids. You don't want that. So, so there are many other reasons why you might reject it other than a hazardous material. It would be the same thing for rail. You just would test it, you don't use it, send it back. Again, uh, the reassurance that you have when you get it by rail, somebody had to collect that elsewhere. They're subject to an aggregation permit. So that is not arriving at, at our site as, as a used motor oil. It's arriving at our site as a permitted waste derived fuel. So it's far different. So we love that because we know it's been tested, then we verify that testing. Now, trust me, I, you know, we're not taking some other person's test as, you know, the gospel. We're going to test it, but we're going to hold it and test it and then put it in our system. All right, thank you. I'm good for right now. <clears throat> Mr. Snipes? Uh, yeah, seeing as we were just talking about what might be in the product, solvents, et cetera, as you said, when you do the cleaning, again, again the questions I have are, uh, I guess, sort of environmental in nature that people have been asking, and then I guess we'll go on later and talk about waivers and those kinds of things. Um, when you clean it and you say you're removing solvents, et cetera, what happens to those, I'm going to call them waste products, that I know as it comes in, it's kind of a waste product, but you're going to recycle it and use it. But what you take out that you don't want, the impurities or whatever you want to call them, that becomes a waste. I'm just going to call it a waste product. What do you do with those, and how are you protected? All of the products are recycled. So when, when I say, you know, it comes out into the asphalt extender, that product is ready for commercial use. So typically, that's where all the metals and, and any of the, any solids find their way into that. The light products are all purified, and they're actually the components of motor oil. Obviously, in some of these waste oils, you get a little bit of gasoline and you get a little two oil, but that's a commercial product that can be sold either for agricultural use or to a refiner to upgrade into his motor fuels. So everything you're extracting has some saleable value that can be sold or it's going to be moved out as a product to someone else. Absolutely. Uh, that's true. Now, when we run, if you put 100 barrels into the plant, 5% of it comes out as water and light ends and fuel. Even that fuel, that light gas, we take and recirculate that into the firebox and we burn that. 
those emissions out of uh, the heater are then scrubbed through a thermal oxidizer and a, and a caustic scrubber to be clean. Uh, we felt as a recycling facility uh, to have the em air emissions as low as we possibly could with state-of-the-art technology. So our, you know, were you to burn this used motor oil, you would generate 100 tons of volatile organics. In our process, it's 2.4. That was my other question. When, when this feeder product or whatever you were calling it arrives, it's, uh, it's already in a form that it could simply be burned as a, as a fuel somewhere else. Yes, it's, it's, it's certified by another collector as a waste-derived fuel. Uh, you mentioned ultimately you'd be interested in having the product come in by water. Could you just describe, at least in general terms, the environmental protections that would protect in case of spill? And also, since you mentioned that this product is so viscous, it doesn't really uh, seep or infiltrate into soil, how does it act in water if there were to be a spill? Well, I think we're all familiar with, you know, the, the marks we see on the pavement outside. Some of that's, you know, when it rains some at a gas station. Some of that's gasoline, but some of that's motor oil. So motor oil does float. It's, it's gravity. It's uh, lighter than water. So, so it floats, and that's why it doesn't seep down into the groundwater. Uh, so, that, so that's point, I mean, that's just the nature of it. And if, if things are brought in by barge, how are they, what are the basic safety procedures to keep accidents or spills from happening? Sure, so I, I will tell you that this material is coming into the Port of Philadelphia right now by barge. Uh, it's being shipped from New York Harbor into the Port of Philadelphia and being used by uh, six oil uh, sellers in the area as a cutter stock to, you know, bring the viscosity levels of the fuels they're burning to the right level. Um, so it's in the harbor already, and it's and it's typical protection that you have when you handle oil products. Uh, as an example, when when di either loading a barge or offloading a barge, typically you have a boom around it so that should there be a catastrophic spill, it can be contained immediately by that boom, and then you send a vacuum truck down and they can suck it out immediately. Um, so that's, that's typically how the, the, the material's handled. You know, the, the barge isn't, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. It's not gonna be the size of the Exxon, Exxon Valdez, right? It's no, these, this, uh, don't, don't forget, uh, in, in terms of uh, oil shipments, this plant is, you know, a Tonka toy, it's very small. So, you know, the refineries at Marcus Hook and, you know, over in Paulsboro, they'll run at three and 400,000 barrels a day. This is 2,500 barrels a day. So our, the ingress and egress of products in petroleum sense are quite small. Now that doesn't diminish the, you know, if you get oil and water, it's still no matter how much it is, you don't like that. So uh, the point is, is that the, the infrastructure exists to handle that today, and we're doing that in a fashion that uh, is exactly <coughs> identical to how it's handled elsewhere. Thank you, John. Can I real quick on that same yeah, topic? Okay. So there are 55-gallon drums that are coming in on these barges, or what kind of containers are you offloading? Oh, oh I'm sorry, no. Um, this is one of the reasons we like to get the, the barges. If we get a barge load of oil, it means some other aggregate or some other collector has brought in, you know, hundreds of small trucks, put them in a tank, tested the material, he then loads it on the barge, he gauges how much he's put on the barge. He sends those tests to me. The barge steams around from New York. I get it a day later. But I know what the characteristics of that oil are. I don't offload that oil until I've tested it. And I love getting it. It, it, it typically will ship in 20 to 25,000 barrels per barge load. Sometimes you can get larger than that, up to 50,000 barrels. So how do you get it from the barge to your plant? So we, uh, we have several offers, uh, one of which is from Kinder Morgan to give us a tank down at the port that was formerly used for six oil, and they would refurbish that. We would be able to bring in by barge to that tank and then truck over to the plant. Okay. 
Um, we also have terminal operations that are available to us in the Port of Philadelphia, specifically down on the Schuylkill River, that we may use as our barge facility, in which case we will rail our truck up here. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Sorry, Jonathan. Um, yeah, you mentioned um, rainwater and possible contamination of rainwater. How would that happen? Just in your, you mentioned the impermeable um, basins, I guess, for spill containment. Is that the only place where rainwater would become contaminated? And do you ship it out, or do you treat it on, treat it on site? It, uh, what you have in any petroleum terminal storage facility or valves, valve stems that are susceptible to leak. So, or, you know, a valve or a tank cover and so forth. So from time to time, you do get visible sheen in the, ra in the rainwater. But that doesn't mean that the, that the water is contaminated. So when you, you can either vacuum the sheen off or you can discharge to a level where you're confident that it's only rainwater. And you're, so this is assuming that all the rainwater is being collected at a, at a certain point, anything that could have been contaminated around impermeable surfaces well, that's being collected. So, so as an example, that's one of the things I explained in the process area, right? That has a lot of valves and so forth in there. So that pad is concrete, so it's impermeable. It has a dike around the edge of it, and then it has sumps that drain into a central location, which uh, is right here. And in that, that then goes into that sump, and if it's oil and water mixture, it goes through a separator. It separates the oil and the water. The oil you suck back up in a vacuum truck and you can put right back in your feed system. Uh, the water you can then put over here into the containment pond, where the retainment pond where you test it to see its characteristics. If it's suitable for discharge, you can discharge it. If it doesn't meet those, you can either treat it or you can haul it off site and have it treated and disposed of. And just, I mean, I'm sure that, uh, you know, some of the questions coming from the public are around these kinds of issues. So in terms of uh, who, are you testing it? Is the DEP looking at your records or are they coming to test it or how does that happen? Uh, uh, typically those tests are, are done internally and submitted to the DEP. Um, I could let Henry, uh, who's from Conestoga Rover, speak a little bit to the technical aspects of that reporting system to the department. Just, uh, just briefly, in a, in a general sense, so we understand. Sure. Come on up, Henry. Okay. Yes, I'm Henry Alexander. I'm with Conestoga Rovers and Associates, and we're preparing the permits for the uh, new Sea View operation. Uh, the permit which would apply would be the stormwater permit, which is an NP, uh, National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System uh, permit or an NPDES permit. And uh, this permit requires that you uh, test all water, uh, collect all water which is in contact with any industrial operation. You test it uh, to determine uh, that it is clean before you discharge it uh, to the stormwater. Uh, this is a, uh, a system which is used throughout industry. Uh, in this uh, system, the uh, uh, industry itself performs the uh, uh, testing after a rain, and uh, they will from there uh, keep a uh, record and the record is put into the uh, NPDES stormwater uh, permitted uh, pollution uh, control uh, plan uh, for a three-year period, and uh, the DEP comes in and takes a look at those records. Okay, thank you. That's what I have for now. Okay. Mr. Dentz? Yeah, we covered most of my questions. Uh, this is definitely not hazardous waste, you said. So this can be trucked in right now, and this is running up and down our roads, even if it's not coming to Falls Township. Uh, it's my belief that in the township, you currently have two of these operations uh, operating. One is Heritage Crystal Clean, and the other is Safety Clean, where they're bringing this material in and doing this operation exactly as we contemplate it today. So there's no new hazard for the township as far as traffic? No, and no, there is not. 
All I right. mean, I, I really believe this to be a very safe, clean operation. Mm -hmm. It's designed that way. Um, it is far, far safer than the exotic refineries that you hear, although it is a refinery. I'm not denying that. Uh, but I, I, it's a good operation. It's a clean operation, and the township will be proud of it because it's not, you know, you don't see a lot of slop sitting around. These places are incredibly clean and fun to, fun to look at. I, you know, I, I happen to get a kick out of it. But, you know, I mean, I like touring that industrial site. But thank you. I have a question then for our township engineer, Mr. Jones, um, or Sullivan, I'm sorry. Under stormwater management ordinance, the waiver for the 15 inch storm pipe, can you comment on that? Is What are we waiving it so that they can do? You're allowing to use the smaller than 15 inch in certain areas, not in the containment areas, but in other areas of the site. So it's not a problem? It's not a problem. Okay. That's all I had. Mr. Rocco? Uh, yeah, I'm um, excited about the uh, 50 jobs that are possibly going to be created. Can you uh, talk to the construction jobs as well? What's the um, what's the duration? How, how you know how complicated is this this uh, facility? Well, um, the facility is uh, complex from a you know a processing standpoint, but uh, you know the multiplier for the construction jobs is always you know subject to conjecture, but. Uh, my experience in the past is that, you know, building these units, it's two to three hundred construction jobs. We, you know, clearly, uh, you know, it's our current plan to use uh, as much, uh, you know, local contracting as we can. Uh, we believe that ultimately the EPC contractor will be from this area, a local engineering company that's done a lot of work at all the refineries up and down the river. Uh, it's Hudson Engineering, and they, in fact, built uh, both of my plants and did most of the civil work. So I have a high degree of confidence in their ability to deliver on time and uh, on budget. Now, uh, you know, my current timing estimate is, you know, I, I don't know how long the permitting and zoning issues take, but, uh, you know, assuming that I can get everything uh, by March of next year, uh, I would like to start construction in June or July. It takes about a year to put up the initial operation, uh, and, and I would love to have commercial product being produced here by, you know, June or July of 2015. Okay, so it sounds like a pretty big construction job as well. Oh, it's a very big construction job. I, I mean, my, our current estimate is approximately $65 million in overall construction cost. Okay, good. Um, can you give me an idea? You mentioned 1.2 million gallon tank. How big is that? Uh, they're actually, these tanks are quite small. I mean, the tanks in my former refinery were 200 million gallons. So uh, these are relatively small. None of them is in excess. I, th I think I have the dimensions in here. So yeah, the plan has. Your idea of small and ours aren't the same. Yeah, I, was right. I think so it says 78 feet in diameter. Yeah. How Which is a big tank. Yeah, well, how, the, how reason, the reason that is is that's because we wanted to avoid piling and we'd like to put it on concrete pads. Mm -hmm. So we made the width Wider, just yeah. to spread out the load and therefore we go with lower sidewalls. So, I mean, it, existing on the property, you have the towers that are up 135 feet. We don't expect uh, to our towers to be anything above 100, and our tanks will certainly be below 40 feet. Okay, and uh, can I ask uh, one last question? That's about um, the newly created company. Yes. Uh, um, I know that was the question that Mr. Um, Tatham. Tatham? Tatham. Tatham asked. Um, so you've kind of spun off a company just for this uh, use? This is a single purpose LLC for the purpose of building, owning, and constructing this unit. It was done that way uh, for ease of project financing, not for any other reason. It's because the lender wishes to have one entity that, it, that should we default under the loan, it can come in and operate that facility. So uh, that's why it was done. Uh, um, New Seaview LLC has raised approximately $12.5 million for the permitting and initial capitalization, and we have a loan 
pledged for 50 million from several groups. Okay, thank you. That's uh, all I have. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you had a couple questions. Just um, in terms of the operations, an operations question. You have trucks coming in, uh, the materials being loaded into small tanks, 10,000 gallons roughly each, then making its way to the big feed oil tanks, then making its way into their facility, and then kind of making its way around to the smaller tanks. H how is it moving from tank to tank to facility back to tank? Is it pipes above ground, underground? So all of the pipes that I put in the facilities, the only ones that will ever go underground are the ones that are there by U.S. Steel mm -hmm. and AEP who put some fire water stuff. I find having pipes exposed where you can inspect them is much easier and more prudent. So all of my ingress and egress of products around the property would be done in above grade piping that's available for visual inspection. Okay. All right. Um, another question. I'm trying to think. I had a couple questions for the engineer, uh, Mr. Sullivan. Um, one was on, one of the waivers was for the, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Uh, that was for the BMPs. Yeah, I had the same question. Applicants requesting a waiver for the infiltration BMPs. Um, what's that for and why are we giving them that? Well, we, we don't want them to infiltrate uh, any of the stormwater on the site. Uh, for be due to the possibility of contamination. Okay. So that's why we, that waiver seems to be appropriate. Okay. Right, that makes sense. All right. Uh, then we had the 15 but, um, And also, I guess your thoughts, Mr. Sullivan, and I understand Mr. Hecker's argument. Um, I'm taking a look at Subdivision Land Development Ordinance, Section 191.48. Um, require street trees be planted on both sides of all streets within any land development. And I guess Mr. Hecker's point is that was waived it's in sort of running in conjunction with the zoning issue. Uh, you know, whether it was waived when AEP came in in terms of not having to put trees there. Um, and, you know, since it was waived, then it doesn't be, uh, it just seems to me just cleaner to have just, I mean, obviously we're not going to have you plant street trees and there's, this is an industrial site, there are no street trees anywhere around. This just seems to me to be cleaner just to give a waiver to that instead of just kind of assuming that the older waiver carries over. Yes. Yes. Uh, you, you, you have every right to ask for those trees if, if you think that would be appropriate. Uh, it was not appropriate for AE Poly, so it's probably not appropriate here, but th there's no existing waivers because this is a new project and a new applicant. Okay. So I'd be, I mean, I myself, I'd be fine just adding 191.48 as a waiver. Um, and I would defer to the board on that. Yeah. I, it seemed so to me that the waivers. Yeah. Um, we we'll charge you per waiver, so. I'm sorry? We'll <laughs> <laughs> charge you per waiver. <laughs> <laughs> it, just, it just seemed to me it's already been granted when that property was developed, but Thank if you. it's the board's preference, if it's cleaner, I have no problem with that. Okay. Okay. I didn't consider the waivers like an annuity, you know, where it just. Right. Keeps <laughs> time, so. um, and I'm looking back over some of the other questions that I think uh, a lot of these, uh, I think, have been answered, uh, to, I think, to my satisfaction. Uh, we'll open this up for some public comment. Can I ask one, oh, one sure. last thing? Absolutely. Uh, the waiver request for the map requ the, uh, requiring a location map drawn on the scale of not less than one inch, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, municipal boundaries. Is that because we already have pretty good maps of this entire area? Well, they drew it a different scale because of the, the size of you know, the U.S. Steel complex. A different scale, right. Yeah, it's, it's just a scale. Thing. Okay. I also want to say I appreciate your offer of the uh, funds in lieu of the trees. That's always helpful for them. You can put them, put the trees where they'll do the most good. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. All right, so uh, are there any public Mr. comment? Oh, Mr. Sorry. Chairman, before you open up for public comment, if I could ask Absolutely. Mr. Hecker a question. Sure. Uh, Mr. Hecker, can you um, speak to the board regarding the uh, bonding and insurance requirements that will be required um, of this company by DEP? Uh, one of the questions that was asked earlier was what happens if you go belly up and the site needs to be cleaned up or remediated? And I'm aware that normally you have these bonding and insurance requirements with DEP to address just that issue. So if you could just let the board and the public know. I, I think Bill alluded to that, and I'm going to let Bill answer that question. Um, I would like to have Henry Alexander answer that. He was the one who was responsible for submitting the permits to the DEP. Yeah. 
Oh, it's a hot potato. It's no, no, it's because he, <laughs> he, he wrote the permit application oh, and he submitted it to DEP and, and uh, it was subject to several revisions based upon where we were putting each tank and Henry is much more facile with it. <laughs> yes, get yourself on camera, Mr. Alexander. <laughs> Under the residual waste regulations, you're required to have a uh, bond uh, to uh, set aside money for uh, the possibility that you will be unable to uh, continue at some point and that the DEP may have to step in and uh, uh, el eliminate all of the materials you have there uh, to sell off anything and to uh, just uh, get rid of the hazardous waste and anything else that is there. Uh, so you go through a uh, process of bonding sheets in which you determine the cost of each of the aspects plus the follow-on costs of monitoring wells and anything else that would be required and you come up with a number and I believe it was uh, somewhere around seven, 700,000 and change. And uh, that would be what would be required for the bond. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Is there any public comment? Questions? See one hand. Is there a motion to open public comment? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ma'am? Come to me. Come to the, if, if, if you had a question, sure you can come to the microphone. Obviously, the folks from uh, New Seaview are well prepared, and uh, you ask wonderful questions. So it's refreshing to be here and to see the con concern you have for safety and for the environment. Um, having been an environmentalist, though not an expert in this field, um, I still have some questions about what will this do for the people of Falls Township and what risks there are, even though I'm convinced after hearing the presentation that these folks will do their best not to have the risks. And uh, one of the things I'm concerned about is the size of the facility. You know, I keep hearing how small this is. And 200 million gallon tanks were, you know, somewhere else and could be here. And I would like to know how uh, much bigger it could grow on these 32 um, uh, square miles. And acres. Acres, acres rather. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> what am I saying? And so anyway, so the size of the facility, it's obviously going to be an international facility as well as national, getting um, oils from Canada as well as from other states in the south and the north all over. So we're talking about a national facility and we're talking about 50 investors who are going to um, believe in this project and put up the money and that's very good. Um, I'm wondering what Falls Township will get, since there are no taxes, and so um, that's one of my questions. I don't know if okay. you'd like to answer it now. I have just a couple of others very quick. One of them is um, the uh, uh, air contamination. If there's a storm like Sandy, some of the treatment takes place in these water ponds, rainwater, et cetera, and it, the stuff is in treatment. It's not all treated like that. So if there is a storm and this, these chemicals get whipped up and get blown by the wind and something like Sandy can take them 100 miles, of course, it's the people right around the facility that would have the biggest exposure. So it's, um, and the same happens with the fire. So the, you know, what happens when there is a fire or when there is a, a bad storm that really whips up the chemicals that are there and that are usually contained. 
um, I just would urge you to get these questions answered mm -hmm. because they're important. I know the 50 jobs are important. I know the 300 jobs with the construction are important. I also know that 10 or 20 years from now, we want the children of that live around here to be safe. We don't want them to get cancer or other kinds of diseases, which has happened sometimes near facilities that have tried their best and have used the um, technology of the day. So I hope um, you will take those under your consideration before you vote on this. Sure, thank you. Issue. Issue. Um, I can address the, just the Falls Township part, and I'll let Mr. Hecker uh, and his uh, client uh, uh, address some of the other issues regarding air, uh, air pollution. Uh, in terms of Falls Township, as you heard, obviously the job opportunities available to residents of, Fall, residents of Falls and other areas. We can't guarantee the jobs will go just to Falls residents, but obviously we'd, we'd like it if it did. Um, that's a, a huge plus for us. While there are no taxes per se right now, um, township t uh, property taxes, um, as you heard, $65 million in construction will generate fees that are, you know, that can be gathered in by the township, uh, you know, as, as, that, as that happens, uh, permit fees for a variety of things. Um, and of course, we're hoping that this facility will be there when the tax abatement period ends. Uh, and now you have, as you heard one of our speakers earlier talk about, in, you know, broadening the tax base. You know, this is something that obviously would broaden that tax base. Um, Mr. You know, Chairman, could you say again when the KOIZ tax abatement program ends? Started in '05. It was 14 years, so it'll be the end of '19. Correct. Okay. Thank you. So, um, and just um, in terms of, uh, you know, those are the benefits we're looking at, and you know, the, this board is very conscious of the fact that. Um, the more properties, the more businesses we have going on, going into that facility, it attracts others. Uh, and, you know, a success breeds success. And so while we have a, a fair number of, of businesses already in the KIPC, uh, industrial, which is what this is called, um, then it never hurts to have more. Uh, and then we can have more people coming in, more people coming in. Just for, uh, I mean, obviously the people in Falls know very well this property. I understand, you know, some of the people from not from the township. Uh, this was a former steel mill. Was at one time 2,400 acres of steel mill. Um, it's that's hasn't obviously no more steel mill. Uh, it's in Brazil and Alabama and Japan now. But um, what we do have here is a facility that is nowhere near anybody, who, any residents at all. In, in terms of zoning, it's ideal for for a project like this, heavy industry. Uh, because the really there's no, either, you know, air, water, or anything else contamination risks. Uh, no one lives within a few miles of this of where this facility is, uh, and so obviously that's a, that's a benefit that we feel is important. This certainly, we have a facility, the potential business looking to go into an area um, with other kinds of of um, hazardous uh, materials. You could argue. Uh, in a more residential area that, that we're fighting uh, very strongly against, we don't really think is a good idea. Uh, this is perfect for the location in terms of, of zoning. Um, in terms of, uh, I'll turn over to Mr. Hacker and his client with regards to the, the questions about air pollution. Obviously, I can't answer those. Well, I, I think I understood the question on air pollution regarding to a storm condition. Um, in general, the air pollution from or the air emissions from this facility are deemed to be a minor source under the regulations of the DEP. Uh, what we've done to even minimize that is we have treated even those minimum emissions to the highest level we're capable of. Typically, uh, you know, my other plants have gone through storms of the nature of our most recent hurricane, and the the biggest thing that's at risk are the tall towers. Our towers are designed to go well in excess of the forces of any of the local storms by code. And that code wasn't established by the DEP or by me. It's established by the American Petroleum Institute, who sets standards for refineries. So um, it's, I mean, you can build uh, to a less substantial code, but 
I have deemed it prudent to abide by those codes for exactly the type of ca catastrophe you're talking about. Um, as to, you know, catastrophic storms with storm water, um, it's my belief that we designed the system here to allow for seven and a half inches of rain in, in uh, 24 hours, uh, which is, would be proximate to what is the worst ever experienced in the area. Uh, as a matter of fact, it would be able to handle substantially more because the tank dikes that we, the tank dikes, the tank dikes for these uh, tanks, for both the feed tanks and the product tanks, uh, the, the height of the, of the dikes is such that it allows for a release of the largest tank plus, I think it's 125%. So it's more than substantial to take a serious deluge. Um, as to the containment pond, which I mentioned would, would hold water pending its testing prior to discharge, that will already have gone through treatment. So it's not as though it's water sitting there that's contaminated, you get 10 inches of new rain and it's released into the wetlands. Treatment only happens on this water if it's deemed to be outside the specifications. But you monitor the discharge of that water from the separator to see if you even want to put it in the pond. Because you have the ability to take the water from the separator if it's not meeting it, that treatment it's taken out and physically trucked off the site to be treated at another facility. Okay. Any other public comment? See one hand, Mr. Uh, Kenny. I really think you had enough discussion on this thing. Let's pass it and give this guy the okay to <laughs> give us job. Okay. <laughs> other He's other our mascot. <laughs> <laughs> Other public comment? I see no hands. A motion to close public comment? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. All right. Uh, so we've had board comment, public comment, extensive <laughs> amount of both. Uh, we're extensive, especially board comment. Uh, any follow up questions or comments from board members? No. Nope. That was None. a very good presentation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I th uh, our, our um, guests are from the public mentioned how well prepared they were. I would agree with that. You know, we expect that from Mr. Hecker, of course, but, uh, you know, appreciate the thoroughness of the presentation and, and the answers. Um, and, um, you know, I think it was very, very well laid out and, and very <coughs> clear. Um, Mr. Chairman, yes. uh, looking at the actual resolution we have in front of us, am I understanding that the only waivers that are being requested are under Section E? Is that right? One and then two. You you asked the question, but adding one of them. Correct. Yeah. The, the, yes. Previously granted should yes. be re. re yes. Section yeah. Section E kind of summarizes all of the waivers that were sort of laid out throughout. Uh, I mentioned adding in was it 191.48. Section 191.48 and and uh, Mr. Hecker was not opposed to that. So we can adjust the ordinance accordingly. Yeah, there'll be some revisions made to this uh, before we actually have a signed resolution. Okay. Laura and I have been making notes as we go along here. Okay. Uh, and again, uh, the applicant will have to come back. Uh, you heard a lot of will comply, so the applicant will have to return for final end development, go through the planning commission yeah, right to show that they have sort of met those, uh, those items that we're asking for compliance on, and then they'll have to come before us again. Um, this would be resolution 13-37. 37, granting preliminary uh, land development. Uh, for CVU LLC. Is there a motion to that effect? I'll make so that motion. Second. Motion made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Mr. Members Chairman, I, I did want to say I wanted to thank the, the folks who came to make the presentation about it. it was, I think it was well done and you answered our questions really well. And I also want to thank the folks that raised the questions because that helped to spur us to ask some important questions. So thanks to both. Thank you.
Thank you. Okay. All right, item two on our agenda is um, to consider the 2014 budget. Um, adopting the budget and resolution, establishing millage rate for 2014. I see Ms. Gallagher's assistant is uh, making some room for Mr. Rukoff. Ms. Rukoff. <laughs> Okay, we'll let uh, oh, two of our board members just walked uh, walked away for a second, allowing a little bit of uh, people moving around, so we'll allow that to happen. Okay, um, all right, Mr. Gray, want to, um, I guess you're going to hand this off to um, Ms. Rukov, but I'll let you do that on your own. At the November 19th Board of Supervisors meeting, the board authorized advertisement of the proposed 2014 budget. The budget has been, been displayed and available for inspection. Uh, at this time, the board is asked to consider adopting the 2014 budget and approving the millage rate resolution for 2014. Okay, uh, there were a few, um, I guess, minor changes <coughs> to uh, the budget, a little bit of um, adjusting of some of the numbers, some of the figures. Mr. Gray, just want to give a kind of a brief run through on, on what was done. Yes, uh, there were six accounts that were changed for um, salary park security. The original proposed was 150,000. The revised proposed was 100,000. Uh, also for Park and Rec, FICA, original proposed was $36,360. The revised proposed was $32,535. And also in Park and Rec, medical benefits, original proposed was $135,938. And the revised proposed is $150,961. In addition, in the host community fees fund, uh, there were three line item changes. Recreational improvements at the community park, uh, original proposed 12,000, revised proposed was 72,000. Uh, for the sidewalk, I'm sorry, the New Falls Road sidewalk program, uh, the original proposed was 238,000. The revised proposed was $175,738. And finally, Pinewood Pool purchases, the original proposed was $4,000, and the revised proposed was $29,000. Just regard with the Pinewood Pool, um, you would explain the difference. I mean, obviously, originally looking at $4,000, then changing it to $29,000 is a pretty significant change. Why is that? Yes, that was because there was a um, project that um, Mr. Arneo and the Public Works Department is working on. Uh, there is some tile work that has to be done uh, in the pool itself. I believe it's in the baby pool. And there's also a, uh, I think there was a minor leak that they are addressing as well. This was included in the 2013 budget and we are transferring those funds to 2014. Okay, and I think that was true of also also of the um, community park improvement. I think we're just moving some money forward. Money we thought we were going to be spending in 13, we're actually going to be spending in 14. That's correct. That was for the fishing pier. Right. That was uh, 60,000 was budgeted. Uh, we thought we were going to spend the money in 2013, but we're moving the budgeted money to 2014. Okay. okay. Um, all right, so uh, public or a board comment rather first um, for either Mr. Gray uh, or Ms. Rukoff regarding the budget. Comments or questions? Uh, Mr. Galloway? Uh, uh, well, I'm going to pass just right now. Mr. Snipes? <coughs> Excuse me, I did want to comment that um, along the lines of at least one comment earlier today in terms of, of um, some savings we might look for or some projects that might not be done. 
uh, we are not looking, I guess I have the title right, for a 2014 road program, correct? Yes. We're really doing most of 2013's road program in 2014. So there will be a road program going on, but we're not, uh, we're not dedicating new funds to that. These are funds that have already been dedicated in the past. So that's one area that we really did try to look at tightening the budget um, to come in line with what we're financially able to do. So just to make that clear. Okay. That's the only comment I have right now. Mr. Dance? My only comment is that even these proposed numbers opposed to the original numbers are still high. Some of them, a lot of stuff is going to be trimmed even yet. Just because you may see $100,000 in salaries, it may be much less. Um, the same with the Pinewood Pool. We've saved money a little bit each year for the past three years. We put a lot of work into trimming down the fat there and hope to save even more money this year as well as a few other areas. So none of these numbers maybe seem high, but they still are just projections. That's all I had. Mr. Rocco? Uh, I don't. I just want to thank thank everyone on the you know, the administration. I know it's a lot of work. I've been through it a few times with you guys, so thank you. Yeah, obviously echo those uh, <coughs> comments. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you, Mr. Gray, Mr. Rukoff, and their staff, and all the department heads as well for putting their information in. I see Chief Wilcox in the back. Obviously, he had a role to play with the police budget. Um, the um, And board members, you know, uh, Obviously, having a lot of uh, a lot of input, um, Mr. Dents talked about the Pinewood Pool and some of the money that we've been saving over the past few years with the operations and changing the operations around. That was almost ex exclusively Mr. Dents, um, you know, kind of getting involved, and he had a lot of experience in terms of a, a private pool that he was uh, associated with, and uh, so he kind of understood a little bit of the mechanics of how to do that. So I appreciate that part. Uh, of, of their efforts and everyone else to um, getting involved and chipping in with some ideas and different uh, thoughts. In terms of, of not making as much money, I guess, in term, I think a lot of the problem is that, you know, we have a lot of money in bonds, um, and obviously bonds don't really generate a whole lot of money <laughs> and haven't uh, for the past uh, m several years. And in addition, you know, we, we do bring in money, obviously, through real estate taxes um, and through um, transfer taxes when properties are sold. Uh, and transfer tax we receive when a property is sold is based on the value of the property, the price the property is sold for. And with the recession uh, and the lingering effects of that recession, obviously property values are down, which means that the taxes we bring in are down. Um, also, um, houses that are selling are selling for a lot less than they used to, uh, and therefore any transfer tax we're getting is a lot less than what it used to be. Uh, and so we certainly expect that as the economy gets better, I mean, this is the problem for school districts and anybody that relies on property taxes, it's the same problem. Uh, they all face whenever the economy goes bad, property values drop, uh, property tax, you know, the money you get in from property taxes drops, uh, and, and that's the issue. I mean, I, I definitely agree with uh, Mr. Mariani's point uh, that, that certainly, you know, relying too heavily for on basic uh, operations on the host community fees, I think, is is something I would like to see us move away from. And I think we've been trying to do that, and we continue to try to do that, uh, looking for ways where we can um, you know, save money doing different things in terms of cutting back on purchases, or how do we do staffing, or how do we handle our operations. Um, you know, all those things, we're, you know, we're constantly looking. It doesn't necessarily show up in these meetings, uh, but it's always things that we're looking for to, to try and, and save money. I mean, again, we're, we're taxpayers here, too. So, uh, so this is obviously our home, and we want to make it as the best we can. Um, other than that, I don't have any other comments on the on the budget. I appreciate the work that's gone in uh, from everybody. Um, public comment or questions on the budget? See none. Okay. Um, this would be resolution thirteen thirty eight. Thirty eight. Okay. Right. Uh, is there a motion to approve resolution thirteen thirty eight, uh, fixing the tax rate and special levies for the fiscal year? Uh, appropriating specific sums estimated and required to be required uh, for the township uh, in fiscal year 2014. So moved. Second. Uh, motion made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. All right. So thank you for that. Ms. Rukoff, you waited all that time for that. <laughs> Mr. Gray wouldn't even let you speak. You on the budget. You need to adopt the budget. Right. Yeah. Uh, is there a motion also to adopt the budget uh, as presented for 2014? Yes. So moved. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you.
Okay, item, um, item four, consider awarding workers' compensation contract for year 2014. Mr. Gray. <clears throat> yes, the township received a renewal quote for Falls Township's current workman's compensation insurer, Delaware Valley Insurance Trust, including the volunteer fire coverage with State Workmen's Insurance Fund, or otherwise known as SWIF. The net cost for workmen's compensation for the period January 1st, uh, 2014 through January 1st, 2015 is $413,263. This year's premium is a decrease of $7,215 over last year's renewal premium of $420,478. Uh, for comparative purposes, phone insurance solicited quotes from a total of five workmen's compensation carriers in addition to the Delaware Valley Workers' Comp Trust, uh, AmeriHealth Insurance Company uh, quoted $557,402. Housing and Redevelopment Insurance Exchange, or HARI, uh, gave us a range of between $500,000 and $525,000. Travelers and Penn Prime declined. Uh, Vaughan Insurance recommends the township selects Divot and Swift for a volunteer fire as their workmen's compensation insurance carriers. Uh, in addition, the township receives a dividend each year and a safety grant from the trust. The trust also provides safety seminars for employees as well. Uh, at this time, the board is asked to consider Delaware Valley Workers' Comp Trust and the State work Workmen's Insurance Fund for our work comp policy for 2014 in the amount of $413,263. Okay. Uh, comments or questions for Mr. Gray? Mr. Rocco? No, I mean, it's not a decrease is always nice. <laughs> Mr. Dents? No. Mr. Snipes? None. Mr. Galloway? None. Okay. Uh, all right, any public comment needed? See none. Okay, is there a motion then to um, um, award, or I guess, uh, you yeah, know, go with the workman's compensation quote, $413,263 with Divot and Swift? Second. Motion made. Second. Uh, Mrs. Pohl? Mr. Galloway? Yes. Mr. Snipes? Yes. Mr. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Dent? Yes. Mr. Rocco? Yes. Okay, next item uh, is to consider approving a computer maintenance contract for Dynamatrix, which is the company that handles a lot of our um, information technology, support, upgrades, maintenance, etc. Okay, oh, perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, Mr. Gray. Yes, um, John Strasseri from Dynamatrix Corporation has provided a quote for computer services for the township. His quote provides two, three, four, and five year options. Uh, in 2011, the board approved a two year agreement for $91,562. Uh, the board has several options to choose from. At this time, the board is asked to consider the proposal from Dynamatrix. Uh, in addition, Mr. John Strozeri from Dynamatrix Corporation is here for any questions the board may have. Okay. I know that we talked a little bit about this. Uh, a few of the supervisors had just kind of taken a look at this. Um, I know, as Mr. Gray said, there are different options, two years, three years, four years, five years. Um, the price actually gets less. Uh, as you go on, a five-year contract, five-year deal is actually worth, uh, or actually um, less expensive than a two-year. Okay. Um, comments or questions, I guess, um, at this time, Mr. Galloway, or even preferences, two-year, three-year, four-year, or five-year. Uh, how long has uh, Dynamatrix done the work here in the township on the computers? Oh, about 10 to 12 years. Okay. 15 years. 15 years. Okay. 15 years. So I think the five years is a no-brainer. Yeah, the yeah. five years would be the way to go. Paul, I'm sorry, I, I heard five years. Five, uh, five seemed to make the yeah, most five, sense. All right, we were having a conversation. You were. <laughs> And Mr. Chairman, just um, so the board's aware, we are still um, changing a couple of the terms, so we'll just need leave to amend that tomorrow. Okay. All right. So I'm hearing a five-year agreement, which would be $85,662. Okay. 
Okay. What kind of terms are we adjusting? Yeah. The cost just a minor same. language. Cost is the same, though. Cost is the same, just okay. a minor language in the agreement. Okay. You scared us when you said changing the terms. <laughs> Okay. There's, yeah. no, there's nothing in here about Aquanet Radio, is there? Just. Uh, <laughs> oh. No? Okay. All right. Radio. No, we should get free advertising, I think, or something. <laughs> um, the, um, I guess one of the questions, um, I suppose I had a. Oh, never mind. Uh, no, actually, it was answered earlier. Sorry. Um, okay. Um, a public comment? Okay, uh, I guess Mr. Shazer, since you're there, uh, what's tango? Sort of say, what's a, what, what exactly is that? I see tango in here. What's Please don't tango. Tango is a series. <laughs> <laughs> tango is a series of products that we actually developed originally for law and law enforcement. What it was was a um, proprietary virtualization device which allowed the department to take their in-house RMS along with all of the county-based services in into the car. Um, as we advanced through it they started to use it in in-house as well so it actually became a um, an environment for them that they could pretty much take wherever they want they could use it in-house they can use it in in the vehicle if, if they need to use it at, at another agency they can do that as well so as officers move around and and work in diff different environments they were able to take their environment wherever they went um, we have since expanded the project into the business environment, which um, you now have for your administration side. Um, so in the event when the building does move, we can just pick the whole environment up and just move it. They, could, they, they literally can work from any, any, anywhere. They could work from home, they could work from trailer, they can work from wherever they need to. Um, plus if they need to work from different floors or we need to move um, the, the apartments around, there's no more, um, like resetting things up, they just basically just move it and log back in, and they're on on their way. Okay. <coughs> All right. Okay. Interesting. Police department's been using it here. They were the first department in Bucks to ac actually have it. Um, they are going under ninth ninth year or year with it. Um, Warminster followed second. They're under eighth eighth year. Okay. And this is your product? Yes, we actually developed it. All right. So has anything changed with this contract from our current contract? There, there was no uh, wording change or yeah. anything. The terms of the so contract are exactly support. the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions or comments? No. Okay. All right, so we're hearing that the five-year agreement is the one that seems uh, the most logical and makes the most sense financially and everything else? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right, then is there a motion to enter into the five-year contract with Dynamatrix um, for network maintenance? Uh, in the amount of $85,662. So moved. And Mr. Harvey, that would just be subject to final approval subject from our office. Subject to final approval by, you know, uh, changes by the uh, solicitor with uh, Mr. Uh, Strazeri. Okay. So moved. Seconded. Okay, uh, Mrs. Pullen? Mr. Galloway? Yes. Mr. Snipes? Yes. Mr. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Dent? Yes. Mr. Rockner? Yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Strazeri. Appreciate it. All right, next item on our agenda is consider purchase of a canine dog for the police department. Mr. Gray? Yes, Lieutenant Henry Ward has provided a quote from Baden Canine for the purchase of a police canine dog for the department. This canine dog will be a bomb detection dog for use within the department. The cost of the canine is $15,750 from Baden Canine. The board is asked to consider the, this purchase. In addition, Lieutenant Ward is here for any questions the board may have. Okay. Good evening. Thank you for coming. Um, Bodden K9 we've been using since 2001. Um, right now in the metropolitan area, they have 20 dogs that are in service in this area. What we like about Bodden is um, in that time, no department has had any problems genetically with the dogs, uh, hips, elbows, legs, um, excluding traumatic injuries, which you can't predict. Um, all these dogs have been completely healthy. Uh, you see the quote there that, uh, that they've given you also on the back. No company in the industry right now gives you a guarantee. Say we have a dog for five years and their hips go out, Bodden would replace that dog at no cost to the township. So uh, it's just, uh, in our view, it's a no-brainer. Um, the dogs that we've got have been very, very good. Um, they're very sociable. We can go into hostile environments and we also can go right back into like a, a demonstration for kids and not have a worry about our dogs. Um, I personally went up in November. Um, we looked at some dogs that they had up there. They are holding dogs in case we do pull the trigger at that. We, they've got some nice dogs waiting for us if we decide to go with them. Okay. 
Uh, and this canine would be replacing a canine that's been in service for several years. Jesse, yes. It would keep our complement currently at three. We have three now. Jesse will be retiring at the end of this year, 2013. Okay. Okay. Um, comments or questions for Lieutenant Ward? Uh, Mr. Gallas? Yeah, I, I just see that on top of everything else. Uh, because you've worked with this company so much, you're getting a $9,500 discount. Yes, they're giving us uh, a $9,500 discount um, because we've purchased, this will be our fourth dog, so. fifth dog from them if we purchase it. Plus, we've uh, introduced them to other police departments which have expanded their reach in the uh, metropolitan area of Philadelphia. That's a great thing. Thank you. We also do have, uh, as Officer Langan has uh, acquired monies, I believe we're up to $4,000 to assist us towards the cost of that dog. Mr. Snipes? No, no questions. Mr. Um, Dent? None. Mr. Rothman? Yeah, so we have, do we have two, two drug dogs and one bomb sniffer? Yes, we have two drug dogs now and one bomb dog. We're just going to replace the bomb dog to keep the same mix that we have right now. Okay. Could you um, give me an idea of, like, the training that occurs between the dog, the canine, or I guess the dog and the, the handler, the, the police officer? What we like about Baden is we're not usually what most police departments will do is they'll go out and purchase a $7,500 dog in that area, and it's called a green dog. So we would then send the handler and dog to the Philadelphia Police Academy. It's not unheard of. It's a 14-week training program. It's not unheard of on the 13th week that dog be failed out. And then you have to start all over again, but you're also stuck with that dog because the breeder won't take them back after all that training. What Baden does is they train all the dogs. Like when we went up to November, I told them what we were looking for. They spin these dogs up and they have them waiting for us. So then we can go take the handler, match a handler to a dog that's already trained. And basically what they're doing is training the handler to the dog. So we're saving approximately with a bomb dog, we're saving about 24 weeks of training uh, that would occur with a green dog. And then uh, it's just bonding the dog to the handler, which you could probably do in about three weeks, but their training is about five. Okay, excellent, thank you. Okay. Um, obviously you were uh, the first canine officer, correct? Or yes. Yes, you were our first canine yes. officer w with Dante. Uh, give us an idea, we have a few officers now, um, as you said, there are three officers now with dogs, uh, including Jesse. How does the department go about choosing who the next handler is going to be? We have an in-house process that we've set up um, that we've been doing the selections with. Uh, we'll have three command officers, and then we bring in two other officers uh, at a supervisor's rank that are canine officers from other departments. So we get a mix of different people and um, actual supervisors of other units. Um, we go over, you know, basically their personnel file. We'll ask them different questions uh, regarding canine use, the use of force policy in the township and make sure that they understand the commitment that it's going to take to be a dog handler. It's a lot of time. Um, it's a lot of responsibility at home. You can't just go on vacation and leave the dog at home. Um, it's a lot of uh, a work on their uh, part after they leave work here. So we just want to make sure that they are on board with that and they know what they're getting into. And then we have a, a scoring system. We all sit down and decide who the person's going to be. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, any other comment or questions? No? Is there any public comment? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'd be looking at, um, <coughs> I got a lot of costs on here, <coughs> $15,750, correct? Okay. So uh, if there are more comments or questions, um, is there a motion to purchase a canine dog, a uh, bomb sniffing dog from Baden Canine in the amount of $15,750. So moved. Seconded. Uh, Mrs. Pullen? Mr. Galloway? Yes. Mr. Snipes? Yes. Mr. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Ben? Yes. Mr. Rockman? Yes. Okay, thank you, Lieutenant. Yep. Mr. Appreciate Snipes, it. enjoy your freedom. <laughs> You've always been a gentleman. <laughs> thank you. I think Merry I've Christmas. been in jail. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Okay, item seven is consider purchase of portable radios for the Public Works Department. Mr. Gray? Joe Arneo from the Public Works Department has secured pricing on new radios from Kenwood USA to be used in the Public Works Department. These portable radios will be a very versatile means of communication, especially during emergency events in the township. In addition, the, uh, the fire marshal's office has these type of radios as well, 
and is satisfied with their performance. <coughs> this was a 2013 budgeted item and the cost is coming in half the amount that was budgeted. This is also on the PA state contract uh, list. At this time, uh, the board is asked to consider the Kenwood quote four new radios for the Public Works Department in the amount of $14,766.75. Okay, comments or questions from board members? No, no, we're good. Good, okay, yes, any public comment needed? Okay, um, all right, so is there a motion then to purchase the uh, radios for Public Works from the Kenwood quote, $14,766.75? So moved. Second. Mrs. Pullen? Mr. Callaway? Yes. Mr. Snakes? Yes. Mr. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Dent? Yes. Mr. Rockman? Yes. Okay. Minutes of uh, the November 19th meeting, 2013. Comments, questions, uh, corrections regarding the minutes from anybody? No, excellent minutes once again, <laughs> Mrs. Pullen. <laughs> <laughs> and for the last time. Uh, we've been told we have a plan, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Someone's got to pick that up. <laughs> so, uh, all right, then. Is there a motion then to approve the minutes as presented November 19, 2013? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Okay, uh, engineer's report. Mr. Sullivan? Thank you, Mr. Harvey. Uh, <clears throat> not a lot going on at this time. Uh, for the 2013 road program, the contractor, James D. Morrissey, has actually demobilized from the site uh, due to the recent weather we've had, and uh, they won't return until the weather is consistently warm enough to do utility work. Uh, when they do return, they'll probably start back on Makefield Drive. Uh, the current status of the project is work on Valley Road is complete. Um, all sidewalks, all storm sewer is in place, and the road is paved up to the base course. Kirby Drive uh, is also storm sewer curbing been completed. The road is paved at the base course, but ins installation of sidewalks had to be uh, stopped due to the weather. Peaceful Drive, storm sewer installation was underway. That's about 90% complete. Once again, it's been stopped due to the, the snow we've had. And as I said, Makefield Drive is about 55% complete. And, and that will be the first thing they, they do when they do come back to the site is continue that part of the project. Uh, the only other item I have at this point is Mercer Court, the townhouse development next door to the township building. Uh, we've had a pre-construction meeting and they have, they have mobilized for removal of trees and installation of erosion sediment control measures. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, comments or questions from uh, board members uh, for Mr. Sullivan? Mr. Rocco? Uh, yeah, just one, and that's in regards to the Trenton Avenue study, the new item there. Yes. Can you give me a little idea what that is? I think that study occurred before I got on the board, or you? you uh, well, I, actually, I can probably give uh, some okay. background on that. Sure. Uh, yeah. It's been uh, several years in the process. Um, it came out of a, uh, I'm trying to think of when this was. Lower Makefield was looking to essentially uh, close off some traffic uh, during uh, certain hours of the day to certain parts of, of Lower Makefield that are bordering Falls Township right around uh, the Burgess Manor area, uh, Deku and uh, uh, Road, that kind of area. And it was gonna negatively impact Falls residents because we assumed that traffic would then start rooting through those Falls sections. Um, it turned out that we think the problem of a lot of the traffic issues is that uh, Trenton Avenue as it goes from the intersection with 13 down at the bridge. Um, there's street lights that just aren't synchronized properly. There's just, it's just not a good flow of traffic. And so uh, with Marsville and Lower Makefield, we kind of agreed that we would try to apply, we'd apply for a PennDOT grant to do a study of that road mm -hmm. to see what we could do to improve the flow of traffic that would help all three municipalities. Um, and the process over the past few years has just been following through with all of the grant procedures um, allowing companies to bid on this project and uh, one was awarded uh, with this project, URS, uh, which is not a, a, com a firm we've used before, engineering firm. And so they are gonna start the process of actually going through and making the study and then making recommendations about how to improve um, this uh, that, that specific uh, avenue uh, of traffic. And um, I forget, the grant was for roughly, I think $100,000, something around that area, 110. Uh, for the study to be done, so. Okay. And it said there was a public meeting. Where, where would that be held? There was a meeting last Thursday to discuss 
having a public meeting sometime early in January. Yeah, where, where at though, is it here? It'll probably be here in this meeting room, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. All right, thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Sullivan? Yes. When we talked about the road program last, um, you had a firm date that they were gonna to return to work on Makefield Road, James D. Morrissey, of June, or January 6th. Is that still happening, or is it still going to be weather permitting? What, that'll be weather permitting. Um, there's also the mess over there. So, assuming well, that they can't start back on June, January sixth, they're going to have to clean that mess up. All the storm pipe is going to be relocated removed. to either Lincoln Circle or to another area that they have access to. Uh, there's also a gas main that has to be relocated in that area before they continue work in earnest, and. That's scheduled for the middle of January, but they have other things that they can do, provided the weather allows them to do them. And the other mess is the one on Bernard Drive. That we, that's a lay down yard that they're using that we didn't tell them they could use that. I mean, they're working for us. I don't know who they made a deal with to use that area. They've cleaned it up a pretty good job. They, they have cleaned it up. The only reason that's a, a, a viable area is because Bernard Drive is gonna be reconstructed. So it, it seemed like there was that open space where they can allow some of the, the stuff that they're staging over there to be in the street and some of it to be on the right, the right of way, right off the curb. Uh, it's been a bit of a struggle to get them to keep it clean. Uh, we will certainly keep after them on that all throughout the winter. Yeah, it was a mess at one point, and I know you met me out there. They were leaving trucks out there all weekend long, uh, which isn't happening any longer. <laughs> That's not happening anymore. Junk was well into the tree line which they've cleaned up a little bit, but they yep. still have those large corrugated tubes there. And they also uh, removed the trailer that was part of their lay down area. That's been relocated. Uh, they did stripe part of Bernard Drive to allow two-way traffic to safely pass by. They have traffic delineators and, and, and boards and lights and things. But it, it's, uh, we're gonna keep after them on that. And where does that fall into their plan to win uh, Bernard Drive, do you know? That would be the last thing they do. Of course, yeah. okay. That's all I had. Mr. Stipes? No, no and questions. No, no parting shots at Mr. Sullivan? Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Sullivan. No parting <laughs> shots, just gratitude and thanks. Thank you, Mr. Stipes. Right. Uh, Mr. Galloway? Uh, no. Questions? Nope. No. Uh, the only thing I wanted to point out, um, I keep getting a lot of questions about this, and I always uh, forget when people ask me, and so now I'll just say it because it's right in front of me, and I'll remember. Uh, the, uh, on New Falls Road, uh, the building, <coughs> I guess most people would remember as Alvino's, Restaurant, because uh, after that it was what Rachel's, and then it was Knuckleheads, and then it was Gensarelli's, yeah, and then it was all of the. Uh, it is going to be a restaurant. A lot of work has been done over the past several months. Uh, it is a going to be a Pat's Pizza, which uh, I'd never heard of, but apparently it's a chain. Uh, from, I guess it is New Jersey. Is that? It, it is a chain that I had lunch at last week in New Jersey. It was okay. pretty good. Okay. <laughs> all right. So. Uh, we'll have to, we'll see. So Brick oven sure. pizza, they had all kinds of good stuff. We'll have to we'll let Mr. Gray be the ultimate decider of that. Uh, <laughs> yes, but, yes. Uh, I will defer to Mr. Gray's authority. Giving him dirty looks now that he had lunch without him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, all right, but that's, I know a lot of people ask me, what are they doing on New Falls Road and the old Alvinos? That's, it's going to be a, a Pat's Pizza. So, um, so, all right, just uh, wanted to make note of that. Is there a motion to accept the engineer's report dated December 13th, 2013? So moved. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All right, bill list uh, for this month, $2,437,616.86. Uh, of that $2.4 million, uh, half, in fact, almost exactly half, uh, is essentially pay, roll, and uh, health insurance. Um, also volunteer incentives or fire department uh, for uh, members of the fire companies who make um, uh, majority of the calls, they are uh, given a um, incentive, uh, which is always paid uh, in December, right before Christmas time, a volunteer incentive to thank them for their work. They are volunteer firefighters. You always have to kind of forget sometimes about that, uh, that they, they're not paid uh, to do that, uh, to do the work they're doing. Um, so uh, that's obviously major parts of this. Uh, some uh, road program finishing up that, about $400,000. Uh, salt for the roads, which we've been sort of getting off a little bit easy on that the last couple of years. It's uh, about tw almost $20,000 there. Um, the current road program, 427000 So again, between um, 
700, about $800,000 just in road work, and then about 1.2 million uh, in health insurance and payroll. So about 2 million of the 2.4, you can narrow down just to salaries, benefits, and road work. Um, so, and then the remainder is a variety of things. So um, comments or questions regarding the bill list for Mr. Gray. Ms. Rukoff's hiding in the back there, but we can ask for questions too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is there a motion then to uh, pay the bills two million four hundred thirty-seven thousand six hundred sixteen dollars eighty-six cents? So moved. Second. Mrs. Pullum. Mr. Galloway. Yes. Mr. Snipes. Yes. Mr. Harvey. Yes. Mr. Dent. Yes. Mr. Rocco. Yes. Okay, we had an executive session earlier. Uh, manager, comment, Mr. Gray. Yes, just a few items tonight. Uh, on Tuesday morning, December 10th, I declared a snow emergency for the township starting at 8.30 a.m. Tuesday morning, continuing until Wednesday morning, December 11th at 8.30 a.m. By declaring this, the township snow trucks would be able to plow all the roads in the township without cars parked on the streets. Uh, per the township ordinance, the manager may declare a local emergency subject to ratification by the Board of Supervisors within seven calendar days thereafter. Uh, at this time, the Board is asked to approve this action imposed by the township manager. Okay, comments or questions? No. None. No? Okay. Uh, yeah, the storm didn't end up dumping, I think, as much snow as people thought it would, uh, but still, it was a good idea just to have the state of emergency to help clear the roads in case it, you know, it did. Um, so is there a motion to uh, ratify the, the uh, creation or the um, establishment of a state of emergency enacted by the township manager? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Township received a letter from Charlie Marty dated December 5th regarding Hunter Ryan LLC located at 323 Lincoln Highway uh, requesting a refund of any escrow balances. There is $118.28 in the account at this time. Uh, this has been reviewed as well by the engineer's office. At this time, the board is asked to consider a release of the escrow to Hunter Ryan LLC in the amount of $118.28. All right, comments or questions? No. None. No. Okay, is there a motion then to release uh, the escrow $118.28 to Hunter Ryan LLC? So moved. Second. Mrs. Pullum? Mr. Callaway? Yes. Mr. Snipes? Yes. Mr. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Dent? Yes. Mr. Rocker? Yes. Uh, finally, uh, the township received a letter from uh, Gavin Lebowski dated December 13th regarding Penske truck leasing located at 225 New Bald Road requesting a 60-day extension for this project. Uh, the board is asked to consider this extension at this time. Okay. Um, Comments or questions? No. Okay, is there a motion to grant the extension for Penske truck leasing? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. All right. Um, all right, brings us to board comment. Um, Mr. Uh, no, we have one other item. Oh, one other item. Yes, there is one other item that I'd like to bring to the board's attention. Uh, the board is asked to consider the resignation from John Riba from the Board of Auditors for Falls Township. Okay. Sorry, I know he put in an email a little earlier, uh, I guess, today. Um, is there a motion to accept the resignation of Mr. Reba from Auditors? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All right. Uh, board comment, Mr. Dents? Yes, it was nice hearing from Lube, what was it, Lube Recycle tonight, creating 50 permanent jobs, a $65 million construction job that lasts a year is something that sounds really nice, coming from an unemployed construction worker. Uh, and there's a lot of them in Falls Township, and that will bring a lot of jobs to those people in Falls. So that was great. Um, something else that we've been talking about since I've been here, is when we were elected, is traffic calming and we've had presentations we've had discussions about it and I think that we should make a move tonight and start taking action we discussed a committee a traffic committee which I was opposed to at first because I thought it would delay the process but the more we talk about it I think that's the only way we're actually going to get anything done anytime soon so I'm going to propose tonight that we start this traffic committee it can be however we decide a member from the police force and a few residents or whatever but 
I think that's something that we should start doing now so that we can actually start taking action. Okay. Um, I agree. So I'm going to make a motion to form uh, Falls Township Traffic Committee. Is that the right process for this? Yes. I guess we'd have and to then we'll start to putting everything together. And then we'll start putting everything together yep. yeah. and put the wheels in motion. So I'm making a motion to form a Falls Tra Township Traffic Committee tonight. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Yeah, uh, I know there's, I know Lord Makefield has one, I, I forget what they call it, but something right. like this. Advisory, traffic advisory or right. whatever So we can work with the yeah. name and all that, but yeah, it's a good idea to get people some, some input. And we've, as Mr. Dent said, I know he's been working on this and, and it's been sort of a, an issue uh, with him and, and with all of us. And, um, we've had a lot of discussion on it and our police have, yeah. have uh, been uh, extremely helpful the past several years as we started focusing on it, but uh, yeah, I think it's a great idea. Any other comments or thoughts? The only comment is if there's anyone at home that's interested in being on a traffic committee. Yeah. Yeah. Send us an email. Because we do, uh, I mean, obviously, and it's coming up to that point, and it's a good point to bring that up. Right. Um, you know, every, you know, as we're coming to the end of a lot of these boards and commissions, like the terms that people have, uh, and some people want to be reappointed, some people don't want to be reappointed. We still have vacancies on a lot of our volunteer boards. Uh, these are boards that meet usually, you know, the most once a month. Um, some of them meet less than that. Um, but they're just asking. We don't need any kind of special expertise. Uh, you know, just you don't. You're not. You're not in. You know, doing meetings like this. You're, there's right. no. Mi there are no microphones and no cameras and <laughs> you know. Uh, so it's, it's just asking people to get involved and uh, help us to make you know, Falls Township even better than it is. So this is a great example. Um, motion in the second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Great. Okay. Oh, lastly. As Mr. Prokopiak said earlier, tonight is Mr. Snipes' last night after 12 years on this board. And we sit here now, some of us have never dealt with what he's put going through up on this table. Uh, the worst of times, uh, now it's a lot easier to sit here. It's a pleasant experience compared to some of the times you did. You put in a lot of hard work and Falls Township is a better place because of it. Um, this is a paid position. We do get paid $5,000 a year, but it's basically a volunteer position with professional expectations and requirements. And you put in a lot of work. You've always been professional, and it's been an honor to work with you. A lot of people don't realize that you don't get paid for sitting here. A quick story. My first year on this board, I was unemployed in the summer, and I would go to my swim club every day. And there was a woman that would give me a dirty look every day, and I had no idea why. And then after a month, she came and apologized to me because she thought I was a full-time employee of the township and getting paid to sit at the pool. I said, no, we're <laughs> volunteers. <laughs> and the money you get paid doesn't pay your gas money, and it certainly doesn't pay your cell phone bill for what you put in. And you've put in a, a long 12 years. Was, you ran and got reelected at a time when most people would have ran the other direction. So we wish you well, and we're happy to call you my friend. You're not going to go far because we know where you live, obviously. <laughs> but thank you, and we wish you well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I'm sensing a theme here today. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. Uh, Mr. Galway? Uh, well, first I'll, I'll, I'll say Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to everybody. And then I'm going to echo the sentiments. Uh, I think I mentioned it to Jonathan once before that um, uh, I can vividly recall watching on television, we used to, we used to call it Musty TV. Uh, <laughs> we would actually get the popcorn out and watch it and and watching Jonathan uh, at his first meeting um, it, it uh, I believe you were made chairman that night and the difficulties that uh, uh, that you face down and uh, the grace and the dignity with which you've handled it all it was remarkable and made a great impression on a lot of people that you may not have even realized we weren't in attendance here we, we felt it right through the television set and I just want to shake your hand and say thank you thank you Brian Thank you very much. We're going to miss you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Rocco? All right. So <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, everyone. And uh, Mr. Snipes, it's been two short years, but uh, 12 years. I was trying to think. I'm a little over 40, so you were uh, elected supervisor for about a third of my, my time <laughs> in Falls Township. And, uh, <laughs> I know, I know you, you say a third of your life. <laughs> he almost did. <laughs> no, no. Um, I moved here when I was about four, so I was trying to do the math. But um, I know you fought in the trenches, and um, you know I'm I'm proud to, to say that I served on the board with you. I know you've got a you got a ton of things done when times were hard. So um, I, like everyone else, just want to say thank you, and um, I'm sure you'll be around 
We so. know where he lives. Yeah, we know where you live. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, yeah, I'm going to echo, obviously, the, the first, you know, being uh, everyone a uh, Merry Christmas and, and a very happy New Year. This is our last meeting for the year, obviously. We'll see you back in January, uh, back here in January. Uh, but Mr. Snipes, while he's welcome to be a member of the public, uh, will not be will not be up here for the first time. Yeah, that's right. For the first time in, in 12 years. Um, and it... Um, you know, I don't know if he ever you know, sort of knew this uh, at the time, but I considered running for supervisor in 2001. Uh, and the reason I did not run uh, was I, you know, I'd asked someone, well, who are the candidates? And, and uh, uh, they said, well, Jonathan Snipes is going to run. And I said, well, I'm, just, I'm not going to do a better job than he would, so I'm not going to run. Um, I'll wait in my turn, and I'll, I'll, maybe I'll run in 2003. Um, and the first night, as Mr. Galloway said, um, you know, I think, well, much to everybody's surprise, except for the, the three members of the board who had worked this out ahead of time, uh, Mr. Snipes was made chairman uh, on his very first night on an elected board. And I think everyone understood immediately that the, the attempt was to throw the new guy to the wolves and watch him fail. Uh, he won't be able to handle the meeting. He won't be able to handle the agenda. He won't know the protocol. He won't know the uh, Robert's Rules of Order, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and it obviously backfired spectacularly uh, because what he brought uh, to this board and to this township really was a level of um, uh, dignity, a level of respect, uh, a level of uh, discourse uh, that was that was sorely needed, and it certainly um, is a, is a, has caused a sea change in the way this township operated. Um, Mr. Clark's partner, Mr. Rudolph, uh, who used to be at these meetings, uh, once told me that he was at a conference, and I forget when exactly this was, it was, you know, early 2000s, late 90s, he was at a conference somewhere in the Philadelphia area, and he was talking about areas where he did work, uh, and uh, he said Falls Township, and, and somebody, this is right around the time that Mr. Uh, Snipes was coming in, hadn't had an impact yet, and somebody said, oh, well, you know, the reputation of that place, that's the worst place to do business outside the city of Philadelphia, uh, Falls Township. Uh, and that obviously has changed tremendously. Uh, and it has everything to do uh, with this gentleman who I'm very proud to call my friend, uh, who has certainly uh, left big shoes here that I've still tried to fill. Um, you know, every time I take this gavel, uh, which he didn't use quite enough, and uh, yeah. <laughs> but um, one of the things uh, we wanted to do here is uh, make a presentation to, uh, to Mr. Snipes, um, something that, um, Nice, Mr. Gray, to bring this up here. It's a pizza. It's a pizza box. What the frick? It's um, my honor to present this to you. Um, Jonathan Snipes, Falls Township Board of Supervisors. Uh, 2002 to 2013, Chairman 2002 to 2007. So, thank you very much. I'm sorry, I chuckled when it came up because it does have the uh, gavel on there. And if anybody uh, remembers the way the meetings used to be, there was uh, at least once or twice a tussle over the, <laughs> a tussle <laughs> over the gavel. That's how bad things got. Um, but just before, I, I wanted to let you obviously speak last. This is your last meeting, but I know Mr. Clark also asked uh, if he could have a word uh, in, in during this time. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my uh, firm uh, came in at the exact same time Mr. Uh, Snipes was uh, sworn in. Uh, I think it is safe to say that at that time, uh, my firm, my partner Ed Rudolph and I were not Mr. Snipes' uh, first choice to be the uh, solicitor for the municipality. Um, when a couple of you have mentioned about making Jonathan uh, the chairman on that first night and uh, speculating as to what the theory was, uh, we, we knew what the theory was. The thought was to throw Jonathan into something that he could not handle, uh, make him look like he couldn't do the job and therefore uh, prevent uh, any further wins by Mr. Snipes or Mr. Prokopiak or the people who were connected with them. Uh, during those first two years, uh, Jonathan handled his job with uh, great intelligence, uh, tremendous good humor, and uh, even greater uh, integrity. 
and the plan, as you indicated, backfired horribly when you were elected in uh, two years later and that the majority of the board changed over. Uh, during my 12 years uh, here working with Mr. Snipes, I have to tell you, I don't think I have ever met a more honest and genuine man uh, in my life uh, than, than Jonathan Snipes. Uh, it has been my absolute pleasure uh, to work with him as a supervisor and his solicitor for the last 12 years. It was my uh, privilege to call him uh, chairman for six years, and it has been my tremendous good fortune uh, to call him and his wife, Melanie, uh, my dear friends. And although I will no longer be calling him a supervisor or Mr. Chairman, uh, fortunately for me, uh, as this day ends, I'll still be able to call him and Melanie uh, my friends for a long, long time, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. Mr. Snipes, the floor is yours. <laughs> wow. Thank you all uh, very much for... Um, what you said this evening, I really, really appreciate it. And uh, it feels very different tonight, as everyone said, than it did 12 years ago when I first sat right over here. And um, I have, to be honest, I've thought of this night many, many times. <laughs> <laughs> when would be the last night that I would be on the board? But now that we're, you know, now that I'm finally here, it's, it's a little sad, you know, because it's been... Uh, it's been a really awesome experience in a lot of ways. As people said, it was very difficult in the beginning, and I'm sure there will be challenges that will be before the board again, and I think folks understand that when they come into this position. But um, the change has been really pretty dramatic, as folks have said in the township. And um, I want to thank the board members, the Jeffs, and there will even be more Jeffs coming up soon. There will be three Jeffs <laughs> and Bob and Brian for being uh, for being cooperative and for bringing that kind of tenor to the board that we have now, which is so different than what happened before. I also want to thank the professionals and the employees of the township that have sat through more meetings, or uh, they will sit through more meetings than I've sat through over 12 years. So um, Mrs. Pullen and Mr. Gray, Mr. Clark, Ms. Gallagher, you escaped some of the worst, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> relatively new. Mr. Sullivan, thank you very much. And Mrs. Rukoff here, you didn't have to sit through so many, but other employees that are here of the township, thank you so much for the support. And um, there are, I was thinking back over some of the experiences I had, and I was remembering a couple. One was coming out of a store here in the township with my sister who was visiting from New York. And um, I was carrying some big package coming out of the store. We were doing some shopping, and this woman walked up, and she said, are you Mr. Snipes? And I said, yes. And she said, I just want to thank you for, she said, I think of you as single-handedly having brought democracy back to Falls Township. <laughs> <laughs> My sister was stunned, <laughs> and uh, we had a good chuckle about it afterwards. And I know I did not single-handedly bring democracy back to Falls Township, but as I think about the crew of people that we developed here in the township over those 12 years, those folks had a crucial role. And the folks that really made it happen were the people who live in the township, people who vote in the township, because in the end, those are the people that control who's on the board and ultimately who the professionals are and, and who the employees are of the township. So folks in Falls Township looking at what we had and what we could have obviously made big decisions to make big changes. <clears throat> the other experience I was thinking about was um, going into a restaurant and the waitress said, oh, you're, Mrs. S you're Mr. Snipes, aren't you? And I said, yes. And she said, well, I just have to say, I watch the township meetings. And she said, I love that show. I <laughs> love that show. And I knew what she was thinking. She was thinking the reality show aspect of it, the shock value. And I hope she's watching now and I hope she loves it because there's a whole tenor, a whole new, ten new tenor, and things are really getting done. And it's not, it's not the Geraldo show that it used to be. And um, I feel really good about the people that I've worked with and feel really good about the dedication you've brought and the ideas, your creativity, your commitment, and your willingness to kind of to slog it through when, when things are difficult. And um, it's not just the board. In, in the public now that comes to the meetings also brings a certain 
I don't know, a certain tenor in a certain environment. There's, there's give and change, there's honest disagreement, but there isn't the attacking and the name calling and the hard feeling that there used to be. So that we've come a long way and that's something that we've done together. So I, um, I really appreciate the experience. It really was in many ways an awesome experience. And um, I, would I look forward to seeing what the board does, what the professionals do, what the employees of the township do, what people that are on our boards and commissions do. Just the news of a traffic commission, I think, is a great, a great new idea. So, and I hope to stay involved. So, um, let me know what I can do, and um, I'll be on the other side of the podium next uh, time. Yes. <laughs> That's right. So, thank you very much, and thank you for the, thank you for the plaque, right. and my very own gavel that I take with me. <laughs> right, well, thank you. Uh, and with that, again, uh, wishing everyone Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Drive safe, obviously, in the snow, um, and. Um, Hope everybody uh, uh, has an enjoyable season. So, Chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. Snipes. So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.